The hammer comes down and beats you over the head for the rest of your life with a big national security stick. And so that people learn to duck their head and not speak up. Because, bad idea now. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. Citizens are advised to take the following steps. Find us, armoroftruth.net. In the age of technology, scientism, and pop Greetings, everybody. It's Armor of Truth Live, number 174. 174. Welcome to the show today, my friends. Let me go ahead and let you know that today, this is one of the deepest dives we've made. Uh, The work and the research of years will culminate today in a story that's not only about China. You might get three shows for the price of one today. And... um, Let's just dive right into it, because there's so much to get to. I don't want this thing to go on for hours. Let me welcome you to uh, once again to Armor of Truth Live number 174. Agenda 2052, China is the new supreme power on planet Earth. How would a nation... Let's let you see this. Uh, let's let you see this little... Uh, I mean, let me remind you, before we get started, please... Subscribe to our backup channel, True Normal TV on YouTube. Please subscribe to our backup channel, True Normal TV on YouTube. That gives you an indication of what we're going to talk about today. So you might have to come there and find us after this show. Uh, we, we pray that God will keep us hidden from those who would seek to remove us because we're just telling the truth. We're following the evidence where it leads and we're standing on eternal truth. And that's how we do it here. So please, it would have been nice if I would have shown you the graphic, huh? Please subscribe to our backup YouTube channel, True Normal TV, on YouTube. Here is a meme that we shared on the channel recently, just for fun. This is kind of how our world is today. You see people in boats headed down a river, directly for a waterfall they seem to pay no attention they might even see the waterfall but somehow believe that they're not going to go over guys watch out for that waterfall what do you hear back from the people you're trying to help shut up you crazy conspiracy theorist where's your tinfoil hat source right that's the world we live in today people have been blinded to the truth by their own pride And um, so we ask this question. How would a nation overcome the technological, economic, and cultural conquering force of another nation or another ideology? How could the United States really and truly halt in its tracks the egalitarian, scientific, conquering force of the new world order? Libertarianism won't win this war. Anarchy, for its uh, antinomianism, is satanic by definition. Secular conservatives are no longer conservative at all. Case in point, Dave Rubin and 90% of the elephants and rhinos in Washington. The United States government is currently sold out to the World Economic Forum, and more in, in more general terms, just the policies 
of Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. And the false Christianity of the uh, New Apostolic Reformation, the Seven Mountain Mandate movement, is the dominant form of Christianity that we see from government officials. So what is the answer? Today we're going to talk about language as a weapon of coercion and the Christian response. What do we do with what do we do about all this? When they start shutting down language, what do we do? How do we respond? We're going to talk about the government paying churches. The government paying churches and nonprofits to compel God's people with fear and judgment, societal judgment, to submit to vaccine experiments. We're also going to talk about the Club of Rome's prediction of a new world order led by the Chinese, that it would not only be technological and economy-based, but also culturally and spiritually based as well. And finally, in the third segment today, we're going to get to and talk about the spirituality that's at work in this global movement for sustainable development today. We're going to talk about where it came from and how you can clearly identify it, how we can just shut the whole thing down by understanding what spirit is behind it. All right, we're going to help you be able to make the arguments to your friends and your colleagues, your family members who are on board with this movement. We're going to help you. We're going to give you the tools to win your debate. So let's ask that question. How can we overcome the economic, technological, and spiritual movement of the one world government and religion? Well, you see there, H.L. Mencken tells you what modern governments seem to be all about. The whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace in fear. To keep everybody in fear so they'll ask for help. And you do that by menacing the people with an endless series of hobgoblins. All of them imaginary. Now, let's think about the past two or three years, the past 20 or 30 years. Constant, constant hobgoblins, one after another. We need a commonly held reality, a valid standard, a unanimous eternal metaphysic. But who among us is wise enough to tell us what is real? It would have to be a prophet. It would have to be someone with access to all truth. In a sense, there is no shortage of these prophets. Omnipresent, wide-eyed, busy bodies frantically reciting their errant eschatology. While shaming and intimidating the public to unify under the banner of their eco-pagan religion. In another sense, there are too few prophets. Much of the modern church has been seduced into compromising and repurposing the gospel in the image of the culture. And as we'll see later in this show, the church is even delivering God's people over to government experiments. Transcendent law has always been the right answer. But not just any personal opinion of transcendence and not a transcendence just because it's popular. Never before has popularity been such a dangerous characteristic. The people today will follow anything that's popular. We need a doctrine that is exclusive and eternal, not inclusive and impulsive. There is such a one. He lives. The one true living creator, transcendent moral lawgiver, has revealed his word and law to us in the scriptures, which are fully sufficient to answer all existing questions and and to provide light onto our path forward out of the hands of the evil one today. A society where so-called truths are accepted as equal 
if all truths are accepted as equal, well, that, that is not a society that stands for very long. Jesus instructs us plainly in Matthew 12 that every kingdom divided against itself is destroyed, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. The Apostle Paul in Romans 16, 17, under God's inspiration, advises that we are to keep our eyes on those who confuse the truth with lies and turn away from them. To be aware of those who would divide and deceive us. And once they have been identified, mark them and avoid them. Truth without unity leads to pride. And unity without truth is confusion. Each of these must be guarded against, and certainly the context of this passage in Romans 16 uh, is about the church. However, the world is now urging and advancing a false gospel of man-centered worship and autosoterism. Uh, auto so we can save yourself. Man is his own savior. And so it too must be marked and avoided this false gospel and those who preach it. They use smooth words and flattering speech to deceive the world. They don't announce themselves uh, to you as deceivers. They don't come up and say, Hi, I'm your deceiver. But they present themselves as prophets of a strange Savior. Angels of light. They target the simple, the naive. And they do not serve our king, but they serve their own appetites, their own desires. These dividers and deceivers, for the most part, don't even know they're deceived, for the most part. Most perceive themselves, uh, perceive themselves as noble crusaders for a great cause. They think they're on the right side. Nevertheless, their father is Satan and their doctrine is lies. Now, uh, secondarily, history can be our guide. George Orwell's 1984 still serves us well today. Orwell has given us a common vocabulary with which to identify, talk about, expose, and warn the public about global totalitarianism. If a ruling elite can take control of language and then employ it as coercion and heavily control its usage, then they have taken control of the very context of political power. Language is a, is a huge portion of our reality. So to take control of language is to control a major portion of reality. Not only can they restrict what is said and what is thought, but as the beast grows, it restricts what can be thought. In other words, the despotic decrees of licensed language and the suffocation of, of free speech eventually changes how people think and what they think about. It creates a society that cannot think and reason effectively. It creates a nation of slaves that serve the corporation nation master. Well, God has given us the language of truth in His revealed Word, and it is the antidote to this confusion and mind control. God's Word, um, it is an uh, obligatory principle of life that every person will serve a master. And there are only two choices, serve man or serve God. We submit to the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ and the Spirit-inspired Word of God is the only infallible Word we have. Well, let's talk about infallibility for just a moment. True wisdom welcomes disagreement. This is not what we see in our culture today. Disagreement is not welcomed anymore. Um, but true wisdom welcomes disagreement. Good government encourages debate because that is how societies grow in grace and truth. Anyone who restricts language, debate, and thought 
has assumed themselves to be the infallible source of truth. 19th century English philosopher John Stuart Mill said, To refuse a hearing to an opinion, because one is sure that it is false, is to assume that his certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. Now that's a point well made. Sadly, in the same writing, uh, John Stuart Mill stated that there is no such thing as absolute truth, which itself is a claim to knowledge of absolute truth. You see the contradiction there. So what's the point? Even the wisest among us are infallible. Even the wisest among us are fallible. Capable of uttering profound truths, yet just as likely to utter silly gibberish in the same paragraph. So we must stand on the truth we know to be absolute. And it can be known. God's moral law written on every man's heart. Creation and design for mankind's procreation are all self-evident. They cannot be debated. They are absolute. And that's where we start. When a government or activist acts to restrict language, actively works to limit what opinions and ideas can be expressed in public discourse, that government or activist has assumed infallibility or made himself the absolute authority. Nobody can sustain such a claim for very long. He will expose himself, and they do, <laughs> regularly. So, as is mentioned before, we must keep an eye on these false teachers and call out their perfidious prophecies. No government expert, no philosopher, no pope, no politician or pundit is infallible for more than a moment. Our society, though, has largely embraced the idea that language is dangerous. That's what you see on Twitter today. Um, hate speech, toxic language. We've swallowed the lie that language is dangerous. In truth, it is the suppression of language that is dangerous. But we regularly hear of cases today where language is suppressed as a means of insulating a protected class or limiting knowledge about certain topics. Now today, a common method for suppressing language is to equate an opposing opinion with physical violence. Expressing disagreement with language is not the same thing as expressing disagreement with a stick. In a civilized society, we don't allow people to disagree with rocks and sticks. But, in order to get control of all opposition, to get control of all opposing opinions, these opposing positions have been deemed violent and then attached to the worst straw men possible. Opposing views are now labeled problematic, hateful, and even violent. So there is a philosophy at work among, uh, among those who are controlling our society today. It takes neither a linguist nor an inquest to see that language and by extension free thought is today being forbidden as harmful and deployed as a weapon of indoctrination by global elites through the institutions they fund, governments, universities, corporations, the media. And as our language is under assault today, those with eyes to see realize that reality is under assault from the old rhetorical tricks of suppressio veri and suggestio falsi. This simply is lies of omission and lies of implication. Or, in other words, to conceal the truth and popularize the lie. The deception of an imminent existential threat from the skies or the lie that gender is undecided until one makes a choice, these are examples of the systematic pseudoscientific justification for everything they do. But how do we engage this? How do we engage the world? What about unbelief? The major conflict in the world today is between worldviews. A network of beliefs and commitments 
which help a person understand and practically and morally operate within this world. Every sane person has a worldview. They're not just narrowly held religious constructs. Worldviews are based on foundational philosophical presuppositions. Everybody has them. If, if your worldview, now here's the important part, if the worldview you're holding, if the lens through which you view the world is distorted, if your worldview is false, then you'll have an inaccurate grasp of reality. You will not correctly discern the world around you. Worldviews answer the three big questions. What is the nature of reality? Metaphysics. How do we know things? Epistemology. And how should we behave? Ethics. But there are really only two worldviews when you boil it down. The Christian worldview and then various shades of unbelief. As Christians defending the faith, we must think and respond according to the worldviews we encounter. In other words, we must always be willing to challenge the unbeliever's basic assumptions about reality. Now, we might share some common ground in some areas of thought with the unbeliever, but there is no such thing as neutral ground on spiritual and moral matters. The Christian worldview does not simply differ with the unbelieving worldview on a few points, but absolutely conflicts with it across the board on all points. The unbeliever's way of thinking is driven by their ethical hostility to the true God. Dr. Greg Bonson demonstrated in his teaching that faith is a prerequisite for genuinely rational understanding of anything. That means without God-given faith, you can't reason properly about the world. Unresolvable conflicts exist between the believer and the unbeliever on reality, knowledge, and ethics. All the important, the big three questions. Therefore, if we are to be good stewards and good servants, we must be committed to poking holes in the worldview of the unbeliever. Christianity is not inclusive. Truth divides us. And this is why we here at Armor of Truth place such a strong emphasis on worldview, understanding what yours is, understanding why someone else's is true or false. So when a matter such as government overreach arises and churches are compelled to set aside God's commands to remain in good standing with the state, that is our call. That is our opportunity to step forward and stand for truth, to stand on God's word law as our absolute authority, and then to remind everyone, especially the state official, the politician, the legislator, that it is only God's word law and common grace that has allowed him to hold this position of power in the first place, and that leaders will by no means escape the harsher judgment for disobedience in office. That's our duty, to report that truth to the world. So when we're dealing with the unbelievers, and we're tackling subjects like we're going to tackle today, China and uh, the New World Order spirituality th that's at work, pushing the antithesis means that we do not concede any points to the unbeliever that are fundamental to the Christian faith. We start with the Bible. That's where all truth comes from. All truth relevant to the three big questions. Reality, knowledge, and ethics. Right? It is no victory at all to win an atheist over to basic theism. It's no victory at all to win an atheist over to deism. It's no victory at all to win an unbeliever who thinks Jesus maybe didn't exist or doesn't know who he is, it's, it's no victory at all to win that person over to the belief that Christ existed and was a wise man with good principles. No, Jesus Christ is God incarnate, and God's word law is absolute. We can't waver from that in any way. That is the truth on which we must stand and for which we must be willing to die. That's the state of the world we're in today. 
There is no such thing as being neutral. All right, before we uh, jump into our show today, let me show you this graphic and tell you some good news. This Friday, April 15th, Lord willing, if we can get to Friday, this Friday, April 15th at 6 p.m. Eastern at armoroftruth.net, Days of Noah and myself will be live and uncensored. And we want to talk about some interesting topics. If you go to armoroftruth.net, there's a community post here. I'm sure some will put the... We'll make sure we get that link in the description too, but uh, Summer will be able to give you that link in the live chat right now. If you go to armoroftruth.net and just scroll down until you see that graphic right there, that's, and you can click on that. That'll take you to the page where Days of Noah and myself will be live on Friday at 6.15, or at 6, at 6 p.m. And uh, you can sign in here to this the live chat here on the right you can set the live chat is up now if you guys want to get over there and chat you certainly can uh, it'll be up and until and through the show and then for a couple days after the show the live chat will be up and running so join us uh, there for that let me show you also what we're going to be talking about Friday so bear with me for a second while I, while I find my we're going to be talking about the the jab the experiment going on brother days myself are going to be talking about talk, I'll, I'll give you some more uh details about this and a little bit later in the show but we're going to be talking about what did the jabs do to the blood what are they actually doing days has got all kinds of information he's been covering this in depth for since since it started and uh, Summer and myself here at Armor of Truth have uh, been uh, fortunate, been blessed to to receive information from a naturopathic doctor who does live blood analysis with uh, uh, through the process of dark field imaging. And we want to show you what unjabbed blood looks like compared to the blood of one who has received the inoculation. I can't say much more than that about it here right now. So you, you understand. Um, so we'll be, uh, we're going to be uh, talking to uh, a lady, who, a uh, doctor who has done this for almost 30 years, nearly 30 years I think it is. And uh, we'll talk about the one who trained her how she learned to do this, and what is the purpose, and what can you learn from this process. So, once again, that is going to be Friday at 6 p.m. at armoroftruth.net. Right? Link in the description. Link in the live chat. Uh, there On the community post on this YouTube channel, you can also see a link to that. Or just navigate to Armor of Truth. Like I showed you a moment ago, go to the home page. Scroll down to where you see this video. And click on it and you'll be there get in there and join that live chat this week and let's see if we can get some let's see if we can get a lot of people to come watch us live it won't be on youtube i will we will do promos throughout this week and let you know to remind you but this will be on our website on our own live streaming platform outside of this restricted platform that we're on now we hope that you'll join us once again, subscribe to our backup channel, True Normal TV, on YouTube to keep up with us if something happens to this channel. By the way, another way to support us is available now. If you'd like to support us using Cash App, you can do that with dollar sign AOT Min. A O T M I N on Cash App. We'll get you some graphics to help you see that, to help you remember that. But Cash App uh, is a new way we have for support. Dollar sign A O T M I N. Now, can we talk about this story for a minute? Is your church getting paid by the government to convince the flock to get injected? Well, in Pennsylvania, the government there is paying churches to convince members to get the jab. 
Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf and his administration want church leaders to bring vaccination events into churches. A new agency called, in Pennsylvania, this is a new agency they've created called the Faith-Based Organization Coalition, formed by the Pennsylvania Department of Health, will launch on April 11th. The mission statement proclaims that Pennsylvania's public health leaders want to, quote, harness the power of community trust in statewide faith-based organizations, unquote, in order to convince folks to get the jab. The state aims to reduce vaccine hesitancy through an initiative they have called the... Do we have that one here? No, I didn't make, I didn't make a slide for that, but it's called... It's called Live PA, L I V E P A. That stands for Local Innovations in Vaccine Equity in Pennsylvania. Live PA. That's their program. It is a grant program that uh, pays churches and nonprofits to persuade their congregations and members to get vaccinated. They offer $10 to the church or the nonprofit for each person-to-person -person outreach, well, some things like phone calls, direct text messages, social media messages, door knocking campaigns, anything that involves a one-on-one -on -one dialogue promoting the COVID-19 shot. The church or other nonprofit will also get ten more dollars for each person who actually goes and gets the shot. Hmm. What do you think about that? Is, is that okay? We're just talking here from the perspective of uh, something that is still new. Something that's never been done before. That is still completely experimental. The funding for all of this comes uh, federally from, guess who? The Centers for disease control. Yes, the funding for this comes from the CDC with $4 million allocated to nonprofit organizations and $630,000 for faith-based organizations. Grant applications were open, were made available for application in July of last year and will continue through the end of 2023. So far, 104 applications have been approved uh, combining faith-based and nonprofit organizations, and 93 clinics, vaccine clinics, have been hosted from this grant program. Now, Leo Holman also reported here that it's not just local churches, but big ministries that are involved with this. Leo Holman reported previously that the Vatican was encouraging Catholic churches to partner with governments worldwide to promote the jab. And some of the big-name evangelical ministries, such as Samaritan's Purse, are doing the same. And that's where we come to now. Franklin Graham, on his Facebook page, recently said this in response to some pushback. He said, the internet is full of articles, theories, data, and opinions concerning the vaccines, both positive and negative. There's a lot out there for you to read. I've been asked, let me get you full screen on this. He says, um, I've even been asked if Jesus were physically walking on earth now, would he be an advocate for vaccines? Franklin Graham says, my answer was that based on the parable of the Good Samaritan in the Bible, I would have to say yes. I think Jesus Christ would advocate for people using vaccines and medicines to treat suffering and save lives. Now, let's stop right there. That's not what anyone is concerned with. No one here is concerned with, with whether or not we should trust medicine that saves lives. That's not. You see, we've got either, either Franklin doesn't understand the true issue or he's creating a false paradigm. This is not what anyone's worried about. That's the wrong argument. 
Franklin Graham says, In this scripture passage, Jesus told about a man beaten and wounded, lying on the roadside as religious leaders passed by and didn't help. But a Samaritan, considered a social outcast of the day, becomes the hero of the story when he stops and cares for the injured man, pouring oil and wine, which were the top medicines of the day, on the man's wound. So is that what this parable is about? Does this parable have anything to do with people making personal decisions regarding bodily autonomy. He says, We also know that Jesus went from town to town healing every disease and sickness. Once again, this is not about whether or not anyone agrees with healing sickness. Of, of course, we all agree <laughs> that we want to see disease and sickness healed. That's not the question here. Graham says, He came to save life to offer us eternal life amen to that he says did jesus need a vaccine himself of course not he's god so my own personal opinion is that from what we know a vaccine can help save lives and prevent suffering yes certainly i am not going to disagree with a vaccine can which one are you talking about right this is he's avoiding the real the real problem he's avoiding the real complaint here it's not whether or not, we're not talking about vaccine uh, uh, efficacy over the history. We can debate that for sure, and we have done that here. But that's not what anyone's asking right now. This new technology is not even a vaccine. Let's just be honest about it. Gene therapy, it's different. It's different. Graham says, Samaritan's Purse has operated emergency field hospitals, and we have seen the suffering firsthand. I've also, I also have staff and their family members who contracted the virus and spent weeks on the ventilator and months hospitalized as a result. I don't want anyone to go through that. Well, none of us do. None of us want anyone to spend time on a ventilator. That's not the argument here. Vaccines have worked for polio, smallpox, measles. Now, we can certainly debate this point as well. This is not settled right here. Uh, Anyway, and he says, and so many other deadly illnesses, why not for this virus? It's not the point. Not the point at all. Since there are different vaccines available, my recommendation is that people do their research. All right? Can't disagree with that. Graham recommends that people do their research, talk to their doctor, and pray about it to determine which vaccine, if any, is right for them. Graham says, my wife and I have both had the vaccine. There is no reason to say that. Right. If you want, to, as, as a Christian, what, one, something we want to, to promote fully is privacy. Personal privacy, uh, private property and, and personal uh, privacy, these are biblical concepts. So there's really no reason to virtue signal and say that I've, you know, we've had it. You should too. Right. Let people, as he said here, let people do their own research and don't, don't compel them by saying, well, I went and did it. Anyway, so I, you know, and I, I'll have to tell you, when I find myself on the, on, uh, on the other side of, a, of an issue with uh, Franklin Graham, I, I take it seriously. I slow down and consider what, I'm, what, what my position is, and uh, I just don't think he's, I, don't, I think he's sidestepping the actual question here. Some of the comments under his Facebook post, uh, this person asked, would, would, Jesus use, <clears throat> would Jesus use human fetal tissues along with unknown toxins and unknown long-term side effects uh, being shot into his temple? It's a fair question, is it not? Uh, <clears throat> Here's someone who said he lost his father to the virus and says, I know it's real, but these vaccines don't seem to be effective in protecting people. So uh, this person here says, wrong. Jesus wouldn't endorse changing my DNA that you gave me. Uh, and it's another person making the case that um, some of these uh, vaccines specifically were uh, researched and developed using um, uh, fetal tissue, human fetal tissue, uh, from aborted fetuses. And that's true. This person says, I reject them and reject them based on God's Word. I believe the whole Word of God, not just some of it. So these are good points. Franklin Graham hasn't dealt with any of those, any of these points. 
And uh, so anyway, that's that's that. Um, not so. It's not just some churches. It's the biggest ministries out there uh, that are doing this as well. Here uh, also in a in a uh, county nearby where we live here in North Carolina, in Boone, North Carolina, Samaritan's Purse has partnered with the Watauga County Health Department, a local pharmacy, and local church to vaccinate 3,500 people. Yeah, Samaritan's Purse is generally in the area where we live, based in Charlotte and based out of Boone first of all, but also offices in Charlotte all, all around in North Carolina. So that's Samaritan's Purse, so that's Franklin Graham as well. Uh, so you can see that this is happening. Now, <clears throat> why, why should there be any questions? Also, here at the, uh, excuse me, also at the, uh, at the high school in uh, Waltaga County, where Boone is, they had some of these clinics, the Pfizer, BioNTech, Vaccine, Can you, I need to stop saying those words. That gets us in trouble with the algorithm here. Anyway, what they said is these jabs, this particular jab, demonstrated 100% efficacy and robust antibody responses, exceeding those recorded earlier in vaccinated uh, participants aged 16 to 25 years old and was well tolerated. So they decided to give it to the, the school kids in Watauga County. Well, what about that? Is it 100% efficient, effective, I mean? How about this? In the description of this video is the link to this video. Days of Noah has shared this on his Patreon as well. That's where I saw it. The Pfizer inoculations, more harm than good. I can't, I can't say any more about that here on YouTube right now, so I'll just direct you to this, uh, to the link in the description where you'll find a link to this video and they go through it is it is it, it, at times it is quite technical but they'll they'll show you that in fact what is the truth here more harm than good it's just the truth and so knowing that doing our own research as franklin graham asked us to do suggested that we do we find out that it is not wise to compel people who may not know better, compel people who haven't done their research, compel people with fear and shame to take part in something that causes more harm than good. And that's about all we're going to say about it here today. So you can check that out in the link uh, in the description under this video. Now, moving along in this story about churches being compelled uh, paid, paid to deliver their congregants to vaccination clinics. Amanda McNaughton, member services manager and a resilient Pennsylvania staff liaison for United Way of Pennsylvania, suggested that churches and nonprofits are encouraged to get creative in hosting vaccination events. Churches could set aside two hours after the worship service, and the state vaccination partner could give entire families inoculations. A program like Meals on Wheels could have a vaccination nurse ride along on deliveries and offer the shot immediately, right in people's homes. They intended to get this in everyone, <laughs> every man, woman, and child. It says, or community block party with food and prizes could be held where vaccines would be offered. This is the same administration that treated churches uh, as non-essential for two years. These are the same people. Same people that use their powers to put fear in people's hearts. So it's ironic how they now want to use the churches to perpetuate the narrative on their behalf. Another program the state is seeking uh, partners, including churches, to help distribute uh, tests, COVID tests, in high-need communities. Participating sites must manage test kit distribution, and they publicize the availability themselves. Ultimately, the state wants to establish, this is their, a quote from their website, they want to establish COVID-19 resource centers in nonprofit outreach centers and houses of worship that will serve as long-term trusted resources to local communities, paving the way for 
COVID-19 mitigation as a social norm. In short, they want to use people that are trusted in the community to normalize this process. To normalize the process of not asking questions and simply following through on what you're told to do from the state. That brings us to Event 201. I know we, we covered this back when it first happened, but this is interesting. Now that we're seeing how this is being managed, let's go back to Event 201 and see if we hear anything. Did they, did they have this planned all along? Sophia Borges. Oh, no, this, is, this is Avril Haines, CIA operative. Avril Haines, in this clip, is going to be speaking in October 2019 three months before the outbreak, uh, she's going to be talking about flooding the zone, quote, flooding the zone with trusted resources during an upcoming pandemic that may happen in 2019. There was it. Um, Avril Haines, CIA, operative uh, Avril Haines, would later become, is now, is now Biden's uh, director of national intelligence, or has been. Let's hear what this what we're looking for here is just proof, evidence that they knew they were going to do this all along. Obviously, the explosion of the disease. And, um, and then another issue, I suppose, is, is just through that, if you have a trusted source, I believe in the idea that we shouldn't be trying to um, control communication, but rather flood the zone, in a sense, with a trusted source that then is <coughs> influential community leaders as well as health workers. Look, look, if, if, the need, if the need was real, why would you need to appeal to trusted sources? Why do they need to appeal to trusted sources anyway? Because nobody trusts them. How did that happen? Sh shouldn't we deal with that? Workers, as Brad noted, and others on these issues in order to try to amplify the message that's coming through. And I think Tim's absolutely right. I certainly seen the value of communicating constantly on these issues so as to continue to, to deal with, uh, you know, sort of the vacuum that can be created in this circumstance. But then also with the comments made about the fact that for all of the disinformation that will be put out, it's going to be important to actually have a response to those questions and to those concerns, as Stephen said. And, uh, and I understand from staff that actually there are also uh, intelligence sources identifying multiple foreign disinformation campaigns and so on. But it's all a part of a larger piece, which is to say that every time there is something that comes out that is, in fact, <coughs> false information that is starting to actually hamper our ability to address the pandemic, then we need to be able to respond quickly to it. Trusted sources. Trusted sources. That's what we need to do. We need to get a hold of these trusted sources in the communities because nobody trusts us anymore. McNaughton said, We have been thrilled to partner with local faith-based organizations because they are often trusted representatives with long-established histories in their community. The remaining population of people who are not fully vaccinated are experiencing a lack of trust. Why? Why? Can we deal with the reasons why people don't trust this. Instead of just saying, oh, it's conspiracy theory, can we just deal with it? No, you're not allowed. Faith-based organizations are uniquely placed to have long histories with the populations they serve and have earned mutual trust with them. So they want to take advantage of the trust that churches have in their community. Their efforts to promote the vaccine to their congregations have been successful at reaching vaccine-hesitant population. So this is working. Now also over here we have Sophia Borges, uh, UN United Nations Foundation's Senior Vice President and Head of the New York Office of the United Nations, uh, talks about the importance of combating anti-vaccine sentiment here in this clip from October 2019, which tells you that they already knew in 2019 that this was going to be controversial. Why? Why? Because if there was genuinely a need, if the people really felt they needed to do this, they would do it. I wanted to, I mean, the, 
discussion is focusing on mis and disinformation, but I think what's important to counter some of that is to actually put out information or good, good news stories of people who have actually beat the disease or uh, best practices in other parts of the world that is, is uh, delivering on um, results and sharing that. Um, but also I agree on the point on having a, a centralized source of information and a world body that could have uh, garner the respect of everyone and I think the WHO in this instance might be that uh, source of information. Um, and again, using the UN networks on the ground in many of these countries um, has a UN presence through its resident coordinator systems and uh, I think based on the Edelman Trust Barometer, the UN still enjoys uh, a lot of trust <laughs> around the world. So it's a... It's a, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's a little chuckle there. She's, I think the UN... People still trust the UN, don't they? Right? Ha ha ha. Had to laugh that. Because no, they don't. Generally, it's not trusted. Why? So they have to try to build trust. Because it's very important that their agendas are, are completed. Now we move into the next segment of the show. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to start leading into our, our topic about China here. This is Jorgen Randers. Jorgen Randers is a, uh, you can't see Jorgen Randers. No, you can. Jorgen Randers is a Norwegian academic. Uh, academic. He is a professor emeritus of climate strategy at the Bi Norwegian Business School and practitioner in the field of future studies. His professional field encompasses model based futures. Uh, studies, uh, scenario analysis, systems dynamics, sustainability, climate, energy, and ecological economics. He's also a full member of the Club of Rome. A, he's a business consultant on global sustainability matters and an author. His publications include Seminal Work, Limits to Growth, and Reinventing Prosperity, and also 2052, a global forecast for the next 40 years, which on this channel for the past couple weeks we've been going through in detail about what is it that the club of rome is saying is going to happen down the road because they have they have a, a proclivity of being right of being able to predict the future in his book 2052 jorgen rogers predicts that the world population by the year 2100 will be much smaller than it is today, and that humanity will be much closer to a sustainable state. He states that humanity may experience population collapse in the 21st century. Huh. Interesting, right? The United States will decline from its former role as the undisputed leader of the world. Wow, just think, if you could get a dangerous toxin, if you could get a nation, people in a nation, to willingly show up and receive uh, a, a toxin because you want to take that nation down. I don't know. I'm just, just, just pontificating here. It says the United States will decline from its former role as undisputed leader of the world. The decline will not solely be due to physical limits to growth, as defined in his uh, forecast, but the increased cost of clean energy and the increasing need to handle extreme weather events so the original prediction is that we can't that there are limits to to how much an economy can grow well that's not exactly working out so they're having to collapse economies so having to take control of this but he, what he says here is interesting that uh, the increased it's the increased cost of clean energy in other words to to follow through on the policies of agenda 21 is going to cost some nations a lot. Um, it will add to the burden from declining productivity growth made worse by unsustainable equity, he says. Root causes, while this is happening, he says, are often described differently, much like the uprisings in the Arab Spring in 2011 that were seen by some as a yearning for democracy and freedom, while others saw them as the result of population pressure in a resource-poor environment. Similarly, he says, some see the Iraq war as a consequence of the U.S. need for oil at the turn of the 21st century rather than as a U.S. effort to promote the ideals of democracy. Uh, there are clearly more options than, than the two he mentioned for each of those scenarios. There's also the option of these events 
are controlled. That is also an option. So what will the world be like in 2052? This is an article Jorgen Reinders wrote in uh, fast, at fastcompany.com uh, years ago. This, this book was written in 2012. So let's, let's see what his prediction was. Number one, will I be poorer? He says some of us will, others will not. Shocking, right? The, the way he described that was you have to consider what your uh, well-being. You have to look at it from well-being. What can you, what can you come to expect as normal? Can you learn to live with less and be happy with it? Number two, will there be enough jobs? Rinder says the task of securing full employment may become harder in the future. Since I forecast lower growth rates in GDP, unemployment figures will continue to fluctuate between the barely acceptable and the totally unbearable. And all along, there will be unnecessary suffering. Number three, will the climate problem hurt us? He says, yes, but not critically before 2040. So in Ronder, Jorgen Ronder's writings, he, he, he seems to be very straightforward in, in that uh, climate's going to continue to change. You're not stopping it. And I think that's because uh, the climate always changes. Um, he says the forecast maximum in 2080, uh, temperature anyway, the level temperature forecast maximum 2080 is above the threshold that world leaders agreed would place us in the danger zone for runaway climate change then he says but it is important to realize that this is a politically negotiated goal right that number 1.5 degrees celsius or whatever it happens to be two or three degrees uh, fahrenheit that number doesn't mean anything that's a number that men sat around women sat around together and debated and voted on a number they should use it doesn't have anything to do with what's really going on in the world. He says views differed and still differ on that number and what would be safe. Here's what Ronder says about the climate problem hurting us. He says, if you want to find out how climate change will hurt you, ask a local elderly outdoorsman or an old farmer what he believes is going on. He says in his, his experience, most Norwegian farmers living next to my moonlit skiing forest, are delighted at the prospect of higher temperatures, better forest growth, and the opportunity to clear cut more often with less snow bothering the cutting operation. So there's a little bit of truth. The climate changing will, some people will enjoy it, some people won't. It's not, it shouldn't be a political issue at all. Number four, will energy be more expensive? Yes. He says, after much empirical work, I have concluded that I think that future energy may be 30% more expensive than current fossil-based energy. So all this renewable energy is going to cost you a lot more. In fact, it's going to be the main expense, the, the, the most expensive thing probably that nations will have to provide. Number five, will the young generation calmly accept the debt and pension burden of the old? It's saying that uh, the people who are the generations that are coming into the world now, how are they going to respond when they have all this debt to pay off? First of all, why do they have a lot? See, it's being, it's being pitched to us as though, well, it's because of all these old people and their, their pensions that the young people are going to have to pay for. No, we just saw from 2020 $2 trillion added added to the deficit in the United States. And then right after that, a couple trillion more. These things that might never get paid off. And they're trying to make it look like, oh, no, it's actually these old people and their, their pensions. That's what's causing it. That's what's making it. That's not. Anyway, will the young generation calmly accept the fact that they have to pay off all this debt? I don't agree with him where the debt's coming from. But the fact that there is debt is true. He says, no, they won't calmly accept it. The first generation that has rung up a huge national debt has established a huge unfunded pension scheme is about to retire. Will the next generation be willing to carry this burden and peacefully pay the debt and peacefully pay the pensions? I think not. The old will lose the intergenerational war if push comes to shove. In short, the current generation has tried to load too much onto next generations. This, this will be undone. The young, I predict, will not take over the burden unabridged. Some debts won't be repaid and part of uh, my pension won't appear in my bank account, he says. 
Uh, interesting, right? When you read 2052, you see one of the problems in the world today is the aged population. Those people who have retired, who have worked all their lives and earned what they have now, which is a peaceful retirement, if they haven't, uh, it's not sustainable. Well, if the, if the global order sees it that way, that the older folks are not sustainable, what might they do to remedy that? How could you get rid of some old folks in the world over the period of... How, what kind of program could you establish to thin out the herd of older people? I'll leave it to you to figure out what that might be or how that could possibly be done medically. Number six, will the passing of world leadership from the United States to China be peaceful? Now, this is our main topic for today. Yes, he says it will be peaceful. The United States will go down peacefully, is what he says. China will be the world leader in 2052. China will have a population three and a half times bigger than the United States. And China will be the premier driving force on the planet. In some ways, this is already the case. Currently, China is capable of acting in a manner that far exceeds the maneuverability of the two competitors for a global supremacy. The European Union and the United States, those are the two competitors. Militarily, the United States is still more powerful than, uh, still more powerful outside U.S. territory, but economically, the Chinese influence is rising fast. It doesn't weaken the Chinese hand that it already owns, listen to this, the Chinese government owns one trillion dollars of u.s federal debt one quarter of the u.s federal debt held by for foreigners so of all the u.s debt this is this is uh let's just get it like this uh loans loans for what we need we've been getting it from china to the tune of one trillion dollars of u.s federal debt who owns, right? Who, who, what, if, what if as our debtor, they decide to call in that loan? Well, they take ownership of what we thought was ours. That's, in, that's, a, scary, that's a scary statistic there. He says this equals ownership, right? This is ownership of more than one month of the total output of the U.S. economy. So... Everything that the, that the United States economy produced for one month, we just gave it all to China. That's what that would be like. The alignment of the uh, interests of the uh, Chinese Communist Party and the great mass of Chinese people is near perfect. Both need rapid growth and per capita consumption. Both will applaud it when it's achieved. Both will hurt when it fails. And then once try more. So what will the Americans do when the Chinese hegemony further exposes its full body. How's the United States going to react when, Chinese, when, when China finally takes the lead? Reinder says the United States is not going to do much. The United States could maintain its uh, hegemony if it decided to do so. But I don't think the American system of governance will be capable. Quick, bipartisan decision-making is certainly not a U.S. strength. And I see... Little that will change this fact on the 40-year horizon. It's an interesting point right there. How can, you, how can you take down a nation by, you know, infiltrate it somehow, but then once you're inside that nation, how do you bring it down? Well, you can have people, which we'll see these in just a minute, that, that there are many people in our government who are owned by China, and then what they can do is just do the bidding of the Chinese within our own government. And one way you could... You could destroy the U.S. is to create gridlock in government. Make it so difficult to get anything passed that the process becomes so slow that the nation can't respond to, uh, to threats or, or needs quickly enough to address them. Yeah, that's deep, but that's a long-term way to get control. He says, I see that, I see that will change I see little that will change this fact on the 40-year horizon. Since the country is already rich and the resources are there, at least for living at a slightly lower footing, the United States can allow itself to slide into a secondary role as a provincial self-content country, much like Europe smoothly moved down to second rank after the two world wars. Uh, 
That's optimistic. He says, both China and the United States will be bothered by climate change, but their governance systems will differ. They do differ. They will differ and will help China move fast when the United States will be floundering. What he's saying here is the government in China can make decisions very quickly because they don't care what the people say. They don't, they don't care about votes. They don't care about any of that. The Chinese Communist Party decides and then it's done. So they're able to react to what's happening in the world faster than those of us who live in a free nation. A, a well, used to anyway, uh, a constitutional republic where, where the voice of the people uh, matters. So that form of government must go if you're going to succeed in the new world order. That's what we see here. Number seven, will there be a stronger state? In more places, he says, but not everywhere. In other words, is the government going to have more control? Over the next couple of decades, the world will be facing new problems. The prime example is the climate challenge, he says. It is truly a global problem, and it is a long and it is a truly long-term problem. Such a truly go, uh, global, truly long-term problems are hard to solve if one restricts oneself to using the powers of the free market only. Are you catching on here? Look, uh, democracy, I don't like to use that word anymore because it's been used uh, inaccurately for so long in the media, but uh, a re constitutional republic form of government, representative government and free market that has to go, or you can't, you can't compete in the new world order, is what they're saying. It's also likely that the state may need to intervene to address the increasingly uneven distribution of income and wealth that builds up over time as a natural consequence of the free market. Free market, bad. All right, representative government, bad. You can't have it if you're going to compete in the new world order they're saying. In some nations, we will see a demand for a stronger state capable of cutting through the democratic to and fro and making clear and effective policy, even if that implies less democracy and less market freedom. How fast will this happen? He says, I think we're near a turning point now in the slow societal oscillation between liberalism and a strong state. By strong state, he means socialism. Uh, over the ne he means he means communism i think is what he means he means a state that doesn't have to answer to its people it just makes decisions it governs by decree he says over the next 20 years we will see more frequent instances where the state intervenes and makes the necessary decisions rather than waiting for the people and the market to decide it's hard to guess where stronger states will emerge first, but likely candidates are those nations that have pushed the liberalist thinking all the way to the brink, the United States, and those that have a tradition of successful government. So, you see, he's a socialist. What he said here is those, the most freest nations, are not successful in his mind, in, in, in the New World Order he's describing. The only successful government in the New World Order is one that, that governs by decree. Meanwhile, strong centralist uh, uh, authorities like that of Singapore will look increasingly good as long as they manage to handle the tendency toward greater inequity. Curbing corruption is the first and very important step in that direction. Then he goes on to clarify what he means about stronger government here. He's just saying essentially that the process of allowing people to, to think and debate and vote on issues is, uh, is no longer tenable. It takes too long. Democracy is too slow. So we need a new – government needs to just decide for people. Um, he says, by 2052, the acceptance and belief in strong government will far exceed that of today. By 2052. People will accept government by decree. They will accept socialism, type of communism. In fact, communitarianism. They will be more comfortable with not being able to vote and decide. And number eight, the uh, question: uh, What will the world? Will the world of twenty two of twenty fifty two? Will the world of twenty fifty two be a better world? 
He says, well, the answer depends on your age, profession, nationality, and probably family situation. And again, the answer does not rest solely on whether disposable income will be higher, but on whether your general satisfaction with life has increased. So it'll be a better world if you can adjust to living in a communitarian state. If you can adjust to living into the only term we have to, uh, that, that we can understand because we haven't lived in communitarianism so far, is communism. We have to think of communism. It's not exactly communism, but it's similar. It says there will be huge differences between people. To simplify, the average life satisfaction in 2052 will reflect the satisfaction level of some 2 billion people who have moved from the farm to a decent apartment in a megacity during the last 40 years. Some 2 billion uh, middle-class people who will hardly have had a wage raise in 40 years. Now, that'll, he claims that'll be the United States. You're not going to see wage increases over the next 40 years. That's how the playing field will be leveled. And then there will be these people, the $2 billion who will have moved during their lifetime from $10 a day, like Vietnam, to $20 a day, example, Ukraine. And then there will be $2 billion, pe uh, $2 billion people who are still living a strenuous life in a semi-rural setting in a poorer country. Uh, all 8 billion will have some level of Internet access and be much better informed and be increasingly helped uh, by local solar energy. They will have many fewer children. They will be largely urban, except for the minorities still living off the land. He says, materially speaking, will the world be better in 2052? He says, materially speaking, the answer is probably yes. Materially speaking. Do we have more things? On average, the world will be a better place. Materially. He says, but from a psychological perspective, probably not. People are not going to be all that happy with the world in 2052. Because the future prospects in 2052 will be grim. And uh, that's the lookout for the next, uh, well, now, we're the uh, next 30 years now. What's going to be happening in 2052? As we've told you here many times, the new progressive form of government, the new world order form of government is communitarianism. That is balancing individual rights with the rights of the community. Individual rights don't exist. What about, for instance, gun control? Gun control is not about whether you have the right as an individual to have a firearm. In communitarianism, the community, guns aren't allowed in the community. So you can't have one or you can't be in the community. And you won't be able to survive outside the community. See, that's how it works. The new enlightened form of political discourse, of course, it says it is. It's for the good of the planet. It's for, it's for your health. It's for your security. And it's also, as we've heard many times, right from the Earth Summit 1992, where we got Agenda 21's sustainable development uh, uh, policies, this is all to protect the rights of those in the future. That's the mantra. That's the justification. That's the, that's the point where they're able to take people and make a value judgment. Surely you don't want your grandchildren to suffer for your errors, do you? That's how they... That's how they that's how they play it. Now, China is playing a key role in destabilizing the world. China is playing a key role in demoralizing America and thus directly supporting the concerted effort to establish a new world order, which will be a global transformation from a unipolar world order where one nation is the superpower or a bipolar order, which we've seen before, where the United States and the Soviet Union were the superpowers, for example. So, no unipolar or bipolar world orders. But moving into a multipolar world order, where not nations, but key global corporations will pull all the levers of power. So, we're not moving into a new world order where where they're going to be multipolar nations running it. No, corporations, uh, people, people, CEOs, right, will be the powerful men in the world, not presidents. 
China has influenced much of the major swing to the left we have experienced in the West. However, I am not so naive as to believe that China has done this all on their own. There is surely a confederacy of powerful individuals and corporate entities that are working toward this goal, and China is a very useful component of that plan with their 1.4 billion people. We hear often in the rhetoric about the current global movement that these individuals and corporations are pushing totalitarianism. That's the only word we really have to use, right, from 1984 and the idea of totalitarianism. So we hear that, right, even from, the, from, from our, our, our peers here who do this kind of work on the Internet uh, and, and those uh, who have written about this uh, in, in our rhetoric, this global movement uh, that they're pushing totalitarianism. This is true to a degree, but we need to be able to identify these things with the right terminology. Remember the tactic, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or problem, reaction, solution. That is a method of controlling outcomes on a large scale. It can be used as a method to control outcomes on a large scale, to control people. These people who are in charge, who think they're running the world right now, are very much aware that totalitarianism is what people like us, people like libertarians and conservatives, are looking for. They know that we're guarding against totalitarianism. They know that we know what that is and we're watching for it. So in the use of the Hegelian dialectic as a tool for change, there's always a feared outcome. An extreme, the antithesis is always way more extreme than what's intended. Something that's so severe that it catches everyone's attention. This is by design, of course. But that severe, that extreme outcome is not the true goal they have in mind. They know they can't get all the way there, so the plan is to get somewhere in the middle. So, totalitarianism is not the end goal, I suggest to you. These people are not ignorant. They realize that the entire world is not going to follow a 20th century Soviet or Chinese-style totalitarian movement. Right? Nobody's going to uh, accept willingly a Chinese-style government in their land. In the dialectic, in the Hegelian dialectic, the synthesis or the truly intended outcome is never all the way to the antithesis. The synthesis or the truly intended outcome is something in the middle. The idea is to move the people toward a severe outcome, and when the movement falls short of that feared outcome, the people will somehow believe that they have stopped the movement or prevented the oppressors from succeeding. Right? When people start realizing they're, they're, they didn't make it all the way to totalitarianism, we won. No, you didn't. They made it to communitarianism, which was their goal to start with. They just wanted you watching for totalitarianism. It's a grand chess match with the masters out with the slaves. It's communitarianism we need to be watching for. If you want to understand communitarianism, you need to get familiar with Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. Uh, Agenda 2030, it's the same thing. But if you want to know what the policies are, you've got to go back to the original document and see what they've written. You know, we have... Uh, characteristics of communitarianism, which we've already talked about. Now, what about, how does China do this? How is it that, that uh, China has done or has been used, has been used to push this uh, so-called evolution toward totalitarianism? How are they doing it? Well, I don't believe it's China only, but we can show where China does do this. China or Whoever it is, it's making the decisions for China, whoever that might be. Influencing and compromising politicians. We just said that. Um, we, it's, been, it's quite 
uh, well known that um, quite a few politicians in the U.S. government are are uh, owned and operated by one or more foreign entities, right? The CCP has worked for decades to influence and compromise U.S. politicians at every level of government, all the way from school boards and city councils to the White House. Now, what this, once again, what this is, what this is, uh, is Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. It's happening in your local government. While we're all watching Fox News and CNN and looking at the shiny object and looking at the big circus, all the policies are being implemented down at City Hall in your hometown. In some cases, the CCP uses honey traps to lure politicians or their family members into compromising situations, which the regime then uses to blackmail them. Very common tactic. Politicians use it against uh, each other, too. So the CCP uses soft power, so-called soft power, providing incentives to politicians to do its bidding. Uh, they use influence over Wall Street to shape U.S. policy, right? We just told you they hold $1 trillion of U.S. federal debt. They essentially own the U.S. government, the corporation that is the U.S. government. They demoralize Americans through internal conflict. Communist regimes thrive on conflict. Pro-CCP groups in the United States, such as the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, and Liberation Road were among those involved in the riots seen across the United States in the summer of 2020. There you go. Um, the CCP also conducts operations on social media to divide Americans. During the, so Americans, you know, we do that to ourselves too. We have people that do it as well. The CCP conducted an influence operation on Twitter that sought to sow discord. Now, let's look at an example of how that will also, of course, controlling film studios in Hollywood. Hollywood has an, a tremendous effect over the American people. And if you, can get, if you can get control of some part of Hollywood, you can really affect the way Americans think. And there are many other examples, but we want to look right now at one of these examples right here. The, what was it called again? The Freedom Road Socialist Organization. This is, a, this is a group inside the United States. Freedom Road Socialist Organization. What are they? Freedom Road Socialist Organization presents our main political report. Uh, they say that it's a socialist organization, uh, a national organization of revolutionaries fighting for socialism in the United States. Our home is in the working class, he said. Uh, with renewed interest in socialism today, many have questions about how we can achieve it. Uh, our studies are meant to help you do exactly that, to equip you to find the answers. What are some of their stances? Well, they say no U.S. war with Russia. End U.S. intervention in Ukraine. Right. Sounds right, doesn't it? See how a young person could get behind that? This is what's coming through our universities. At the university level today, this is what's extremely popular. Uh, celebrated International Women's Day. Resist attacks on reproductive freedom. That means, that means abortion. That's what that means. Reproductive freedom is a buzzword for abortion. That's, that's newspeak for abortion. Uh, 63rd, and, uh, 63rd anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. I'm going to celebrate that. That socialism is superior to capitalism. Looking forward to a new year of struggle in 2022. They, command, they ask you to join Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Freedom Road Socialist Organization condemns the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse, for example. That that trial was a sham, they said. So these are some examples. Now let me, uh, I think this is funny here, they're, on this day, 412, 1900, on this day, Florence Reese was born. Reese was an American social activist, poet, folk songwriter, and communist. Born in <coughs> Sharps Chapel, Tennessee, the daughter and wife of coal miners. She's best known for writing the song, Which Side Are You On? And she's there with Pete Seeger, uh, fantastic artist, also 
a socialist. But and one of the they also run this this thing called Fight Back News in the United States. And uh, this is what Fight Back News looks like. Let's look at one of an example of a news story that this socialist organization inside the United States puts out. So just so we can understand the language, right? We're talking about language today. Here's the here's the headline: Arlington, Texas, bigot removed from student government. April fourth was a great victory for this for the student movement at the University of Texas Arlington. Pay attention to the rhetoric. This is. This, it, it's, this is an, uh, let me, this is an operation. This is what an operation looks like. This is what an operation that's funded by intelligence agencies looks like. Listen to the rhetoric. The impeachment proceedings against Caitlin Burge Searles, the racist Turning Point USA leader, that means Christian, uh, and then president of student government, happened with over 50 people in attendance, both inside and outside student government. This impeachment was only possible, so they got someone in, impeached, removed from student council at uh, uh, UT Arlington. The impeachment was only possible due to the intense pressure that came from within the Senate and from the student movement calling for accountability last week. There's a great amount of anticipation regarding this as this impeachment is the first within UT Arlington student government history. Something to be proud about? The leading impeachment manager, Senator Jacqueline Avia, led the case to show, now, Senator, Senator, led the case to show that Bird Searles materially failed in her duties as student government president through her transphobia. There you go. We're taking control of language. That's how you get people. Through her racism and through her general xenophobia. Hitting all the talking points. Through the impeachment, Avia provided testimonial evidence against the, the young lady. Uh, Caitlin Burge uh, being... Uh, running racist accounts on Twitter that called for deportations and, of course, brought up the Discord leaks themselves. Bird Searles attempted to both say she was not in the wrong and that her bigotry are just personal opinions that should not be targeted to begin with. This argument was not received well by the student Senate, which delivered a resounding unanimous vote against her in the impeachment proceedings. Uh, Senator, these are senators of student government, by the way. Don't, don't get twisted that we're talking about. Uh, member, members of Progressive Student Union, uh, the NAACP, Black Student Association, were physically present at the meeting with others watching via live stream uh, as Burr Searles and others uh, with Turning Point USA walked off. Everyone gathered to say, no bigots on our campus. Bigot, there's your word. Right. If you don't agree with us, will label you a bigot because that word is a pejorative. It has a very specific meaning uh, in our culture. Now, back to this, uh, just giving you an example of how, how what, what, a, what a psychological operation within the United States looks like at the, at the university level. So that's one of the ways it's done. I, we have shared with you the link to this infographic here. You can, you, can, uh, you can find this in the description below this video. This explains how uh, the Chinese Communist Party, let's just be serious about it. It's not necessarily the Chinese Communist Party. Right? That's the word we use to describe it. What we just read from this news organization, this, journal, this journalistic effort, is, is, a, is an operation that is run by an intelligence agent. I can't prove that, but that's what they look like. If it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck. If it sounds like a duck, if it is a duck, then it's the duck. It's what's what it is. That's what we're looking at here. So you can you can check out this infographic if you like and see some more examples of the way operations are run within the United States spreading propaganda through state-owned media, plenty of examples. One of the uh, main ways that it has been done, covering up an outbreak and causing a global crisis, acquiring technology by any means, fueling a deadly drug crisis. There is a lot of evidence to show that 
the Chinese Communist Party has at, at least been used as a front to make it look like that's where the drugs are coming from. Where they are or not, we don't know, but that's the narrative anyway. Of course, influencing media outlets, stealing trade secrets and Americans' personal data. This is, these are some of the other ways that it's done. You can check out this infographic. It's linked in the description. If you scroll down, and you'll see a section titled Links. It'll be right there. So that's a little bit, uh, there you go. That's what a psychological operation looks like when it's kind of on the lower level at a university. Okay, let me remind you folks once again as we move into our next, uh, our final segment of the show today where we're going to get to the spirituality of the New World Order. Can we remind you once again to uh, join us Friday evening at 6 p.m. at armoroftruth.net where myself and Days of Noah will speak about uh, some very sensitive issues that we can't talk about here such as this. Unjabbed blood versus jabbed blood. How do I, what's going on in, uh, with blood of people who have received one of these experimental treatments? What's going on? Normal blood versus strange objects in the blood? Or what, what, what happens to, the, to the, uh, the red blood cells themselves, the ones that are supposed to carry oxygen throughout the body? What's happening to them? Is anything happening to them? What's going on? Through these dark-filled images, we're going, to, we're going to talk about this in a little bit of detail, as much detail as we can. We're going to be using the research of naturopathic uh, doctor. Uh, her, name is, uh, <laughs> her name is Peggy. What's her last name? Ah, Peggy uh, Manfield. That's right. Sorry, we didn't have it. Uh, Peggy Manfield. She is a, a resource uh, that Summer, uh, she's someone that Summer knows. And so we've been very uh, blessed to, to get from her directly information, pictures, and descriptions of what she's finding in people's blood, who she blood that she checks and does dark field analysis on. Peggy is uh, she's been doing this for uh, thirty years, at least uh, about thirty years now. She, she was, was a medical assistant, studied naturopathy, studied homeopathy. Uh, she was assistant to uh, Franz Arnoux. And Franz Arnoul is an author and expert in dark field diagnostics, or blood analysis. His work is published in a book uh, he wrote called Introduction to Dark Field Diagnostics, The Examination. I'll give you full screen here on this. This is what we're going to be talking about Friday evening at 6 p.m. at armoroftruth.net. We'll show you how to get there in just a moment. Uh, so Franz Arnoul wrote this book, Introduction to Dark Field Diagnostics, The Examination of Native Blood. Uh, which is the examination of live blood according uh, to the procedure invented by Professor Dr. Gunther Enderlein, which is a good introduction into dark field uh, diagnostics. Dark field just means the background is black. That's just simply what that means. Uh, after running a busy clinic near Frankfurt, in Germany, for 11 years, Peggy moved to Bali in the year 2005 and opened her own clinic. Peggy has more than 25 years of experience in natural medicine and practicing uh, and practice educated uh, and has educated other practitioners as well. She does live blood analysis, naturopathy, homeopathy. She does detox programs, allergy testing and treatments, uh, natural anti-aging, bioresonance testing, neural therapy and also nutrition for your blood type, body type, and your pathology testing. So uh, she's is not just uh, she's not a quack. Let's just say it, because that's what people are going to say. They're going to say, well, you're getting all this information from quacks, right? No, that's not who we're dealing with here. Friday evening at 6 p.m. at armoroftruth.net, right here, armoroftruth.net. You go to armoroftruth.net and scroll down to this. Right. If you click on that, that's where the video will be. Uh, live at 6 p.m. Friday evening, myself and Days of Noah are going to be talking about this. 
we're going to hear from days on, on his own research on this. He's done a lot of good work that he's been putting out on his Patreon. Go to Patreon uh, and search for Days of Noah if you want to see his his uncensored work. The thing about Patreon is you can get away with more than you can here, but you still have to be you have to be a little bit careful about what you say over there because they will shut you down. Uh, where we're going to be Friday evening, we're not on anyone's platform. No. We're on our own. Uh, live streaming platform, which is which comes through our website, armoroftruth.net, and we can say what we like for now. For now, you know, someone owns the someone owns the hosting surely, but for now, this is how we can speak freely, and we will do just that. We'll no holds barred. We're going to say what needs to be said. We're going to speak freely, like we can't here on YouTube. So please join us Friday evening, 6 p.m at armoroftruth.net. We'll put a link in the description under this video too, so you'll know where to find us. And uh, please, if you will, let me show you once again. Please subscribe to our backup YouTube channel, True Normal TV. All right. Subscribe to True Normal TV on YouTube. That is our backup channel here. Anything happens to this channel, that's where we'll be. Please also, if you want to support us, if you can, Go to armoroftruth.net and click on that donate tab and it we have tried to make it as easy as possible for you to support us click on the donate tab and there here are all the options there are also options uh, in the description to this video to support us if you'd like to do that we now have a cash app option it is dollar sign a o t m i n dollar sign a o t men all right if you want to support us that way and let me just say also to uh, our our viewer we love we love to get stuff at our p.o box p.o box 729 hudson north carolina 28638 if you'd like to reach out to us and send us a note if you'd like to send support in that way you can do that too you can make anything uh, checks or money orders payable to armor of truth and then we'll get you a receipt for that you can also donate directly if you follow some links below this video if you'd rather do that from our, uh, our good friend and viewer, Justin, I'll just use his first name now, Justin, um, sent us this nice card just saying thank you uh, for the work. Uh, Justin also won one of the ESV study Bibles that we gave away several months ago. We don't have any left to give away now, but we gave away, we had about a dozen of those to give away, and Justin was one of those who got it. He says, I'm continuing in my ESV study Bible. We'll be finishing Leviticus over the uh, coming weekend. And uh, so, and he just says, thanks and God bless. So I just wanted to share that with you and thank Justin for sending in this card. We have them, we have them cataloged back here on our, on our wall. So thank you, Justin, for that. And that's just a blessing to receive that and to know that uh, uh, our viewers are, uh, who have received some of the uh, items we've been able to give away are using them and uh, being blessed by it. Uh, blesses us, and we're just extremely grateful to be able to do this work. And uh, we want to say thank you to Justin and encourage you. Send us a message. Send us a card to let us know what you think about what we're doing. We like the hard copy stuff, you know. Uh, Armor of Truth, P.O. Box seven. 29 Hudson, North Carolina, 28638. And if you'd like a free Bible, email us at hello at armoroftruth.net. Subject line, say, I want a Bible. And we'll send you a, a free Bible and a starter pack of tracks. And you can use them or give them away. But reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Now we get into the segment of the show where... Uh, well, we're going to talk about, first of all, before we get to the spirituality, we're going to talk about China as the new supreme power on planet Earth. We'll, we'll, we'll make the case for that. Um, today, the world has about 234 countries. Uh, 11 countries have populations of 100 million or more. 40 countries have 30 million or more. Uh, this group of 40 nations, though, 
people with uh, with 30 million or more. This this group of 40 nations has 80 percent of the global population and a much larger share of the global economy. In the year 2052, Jorgen Reinders sees the world in five regions that will look very different than they do today. He sees this. He sees the five regions. One region as China, as, as a region to itself because it's so big. Also, the United States makes up its own region. And then there is the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which includes Europe, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and Canada. This is what the new world order is going to look like, according to those who know, according to the Club of Rome. All right, you can choose to believe it or not. But the OECD, these nations, Europe, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and Canada, is an intergovernment, intergovernmental economic organization. So they're a forum, 38 member countries, founded in 1961 to stimulate world trade, committed to democracy. What does that word mean today? It means socialism. Committed to socialism and the market economy. We just read from Jorgen Rogers, the New World Order, you can't, you can't be representative government and free market. It all has to be controlled or you can't compete. But these are generally high-income economies known as developed countries. And uh, the, these, these countries of this form are, they officially recognize the United Nations. Okay, so those are the OECD countries. There are also the Breeze Nations. This used to be the BRICS nations, but in the New World Order, it's going to be known as the Breeze Nations. Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, and 10 other emerging economies, Indonesia, Mexico, Vietnam, Turkey, Iran, Thailand, Ukraine, Argentina, Venezuela, and Saudi Arabia. And then, after the Breeze Nations, there is the rest of the world. Now, China, let's see here. China and the United States are considered regions to themselves because of the size of their economies. But the forecast is for China's population to level out while their economy continues soaring. Now, interesting, right? We're hearing a lot of things from, from China. I don't know if you've seen, uh, we intended to show some of these clips today, uh, but the show is a little bit too long, of people in, in, in Shanghai screaming out of their windows because they can't, they don't have food. And China is com very much able to feed its population. So what's happening in China right now is an effort. It is, they are deliberately starving people. Why? Well, you can speculate on that if you want, but let's talk about how China is going to take over or China is going to be used as a means to take over. Uh, the Chinese will be the new uh, hegemon. All right? What does that word mean? The uh, Hegemon from the Greek uh, uh, hegemonia, meaning to lead or lead the way. Hegemony is the political, economic, and military predominance of one state over other states. Uh, the report to the Club of Rome states that China will continue growing while the U.S. declines. All right, so in our five world regions that we mentioned just a moment ago, let's see. What about the United States? What's going to happen to the United States by 2052. Jorgen Rander says that in 2052, the United States, uh, well, it, it is today still, and will be in 2052, the most mature economy in the world with the highest GDP per person. Rander says that U.S. citizens are about to experience a full generation where wages will not increase at all, and that per capita income will fall. Of course, some of us believe this is a controlled demolition of our economy, because it's far more expensive to operate according to the sustainable development goals, meeting their arbitrary carbon standards. 
If the United States shifts quickly to far more expensive and as yet unproven renewable energies as a standard, well, then austerity measures on the public are sure to come. We already see it happening. Ceasing to operate nuclear power plants also, which is the cleanest, cheapest energy on the planet. You can't argue otherwise. That will also add to the demolition of the United States. After decades of poor management at the federal level, the United States is now in a precarious position where it could fall from its traditional position as a world superpower. In a new world order where borders are meaningless and mega city states are the true superpowers, an American way of life is in serious jeopardy, including the unique freedoms Americans have enjoyed for a couple hundred years. Jorgen Reinders says that for the United States to survive at all, it must fall in line with the global sustainability movement. That means that representative government has to go. Democracy is too slow. And that free markets can't be allowed. They're too slow. That the government must decide for the people. The war on the people is currently in agriculture. If you watch Ice Age Farmer, you know this. If you watch this channel, we've shown you in the past couple weeks how the, the sustainable development ideas and policies of spreading bio sludge all over farmlands ended up destroying farmlands. And now they're going around testing livestock for coronavirus and then wiping out millions Millions of, of, of birds, uh, cattle, all kinds of livestock. This is, these are the policies of Agenda 21. That's sustainable development, right? What do they mean by sustainable then, right? If, if it's not really sustaining the environment, what they mean by sustainable is sustain my position of power. Shutting down farms, making it, possible for, uh, making it impossible for traditional farmers to feed the people. Agenda 21 is achieving its goals of squeezing out human life by greatly limiting food resources that would otherwise be plentiful. If they just got out of the way, we would have no trouble providing food for ourselves. Uh, Jorgen Reinders predicts that climate change will cause the greatest problems for American food production. However, as we have seen recently here in our own reporting, Agenda 21 and globalist operations are what's destroying the food supply, poisoning farmland. Killing off livestock in mass, all in the name of safety and sustainability. Also, water. Water will also be unnecessarily limited, adding further obstacles to simply growing food the traditional way. Nothing can be done traditionally anymore. They can't allow it. Jorgen Reinders says that by 2052, the Chinese gross domestic, uh, gross domestic product will outshine the U.S. GDP by a factor of two and a half. China will be two and a half times stronger than the United States. By then, the U.S. will be one-tenth of the global economy and no longer a superpower. Mission accomplished, if it works. I'm not so optimistic or I'm pessimistic. However, I don't think they're going to succeed with all this. I think they're too greedy. I don't think that's good news for us, though. I think that they're, they're, um, that they're falling short and failing is going to be a far worse dystopia than the one they had planned. What about China? What about China? Jorgen Reinders predicts that the Chinese population will reach its maximum in the 2020s, which will give it a huge advantage. The 1.4 billion people living in China now will eventually see a drastic increase in disposable income and livelihood. So if you listen closely to what he's saying here, while the rest of the world is, well, falling I guess is the rest of the world is, is, is falling. China is rising. Of course, that is within the surveillance state of the Chinese Communist Party, of course. So they'll see more money, but not any better life. Because the Chinese Communist Party tells the Chinese people exactly how they must spend that income according to their uh, social credit system. 
Nevertheless, it is difficult to argue with Reinders' conclusions regarding China considering the world stage at present. Reinders says that China's economy will be, by magnitudes, the fastest growing on the planet. In 2052, Reinders says that China's economy will be nearly uh, equal to all 33 of the OECD nations. Right, So it'll be its own region. That is a new world order. That is new. And this seems to make sense about China. If you've ever seen the massive smart cities that they've been building over the last 20 years or so in China, huge cities that were built and left empty. It's weird. Why have they done this? Speculations over the last few years. But since 2020, we can see clearly. Now we can see what's happening. Um, it's a surreal sight that has now you know, come into focus. Interestingly, China will not be held to the same standards as the rest of the world regarding energy production. In 2052, China's nuclear energy production per capita will be double that of the United States. Interesting, right? Freedom has to go. Free markets have to go. Jorgen Reinders says that agriculture in China will outproduce the 33 OECD nations. A much different forecast than what we see for the United States. Render says that the Chinese government has been very strategic in its planning and that by the year 2052, the Chinese footprint on the planet will be substantial. Not just in their own nation, but they're going to be everywhere in the world. In a piece written for the Club of Rome, a report for the Club of Rome titled China, the New Hegemon by Rasmus Reinvag, and Danish Indologist, I mean, studies China, China, and consultant in sustainable development, and Bjorn Brunstad, a Norwegian uh, foresight specialist and strategist. In this report called China the New Hegemon, which is in the book 2052, we see that Chinese, the Chinese are likely to influence the world in many more ways than just economic. The report says this, unlike the rest of the globalized, digitalized world of 2052, China will not be, for the most part, multicultural. So while, we're all, while the rest of the world is, is being uh, melted together culturally, forcibly, of course, China won't. China will not be multicultural. The vast majority of people in China are Han Chinese. Check this out. This is interesting. The vast majority of people in China are Han Chinese. This is an ancestral lineage that you're born into. You can't become Han Chinese. You have to be born into it. In 2052, China will be a self-contained civilization linked to the geography of historic China and with no need to conquer new lands, at least in the traditional sense. Efficient population uh, control policies combined with steady immigration to both resource-rich and technologically advanced countries will ensure that the population in mainland China is falling while the overall Chinese population globally will keep growing. See, mainland China's population will be 200 million less in 2052 than it was in 2012. Another 200 million Chinese will live outside of China while their primary cultural identity will be Chinese. Right. So they're going to be in, in other developed nations in the world. There are going to be plenty of Chinese there in their own communities, in their own regions. And they're not going to assimilate into the culture they're in. That's not what Han Chinese does. These other civilizations will not be welcomed into the Chinese sector unless they're born into it by Han Chinese parents. Now, the Chinese presence will dominate the world through economic and technological hard power. That means control of markets, jobs, income, and uh, livelihoods. But also, they will also control these other civilizations through cultural soft power. This is dominating culture with the Han Chinese way of life. Based on a tradition of meritocracy and severe centralized government, also known as Confucianism. That is the, that is the type of uh, culture, the type of government 
that the Chinese are going to bring with them everywhere they go. Meritocracy and severe centralized government. Communitarianism. Well, it's communism, yes. But worldwide, it's going to look more like communitarianism. The Chinese culture will be the one to dominate in a world where top-down scientific dictatorship is the political order. That's the way of the world now. That's why China is so popular to the globalists. China is and will be the world leader in the production of rare earth metals. This is one of the things they produce for the world, rare earth metals, like batteries, computer chips, electric motors, and smartphones. All items, all types of materials that are necessary to produce your favorite devices and the primary implements used to build the surveillance state. China will no longer be the leader in producing low-end goods like cheap electronics, plastic furniture, and stuffed animals and toys, but it will take charge of the high-tech global market. In the year 2052, most countries in the world will significantly depend on Chinese technology, which is definitely a security issue for anyone who depends on Chinese technology. That is why, if things continue to progress as they are now, we can expect national sovereignty to be a thing of the past by 2052. The report says this, The Chinese worldview contains an implicit hierarchical understanding of the world. Now pay attention to this piece here. For more than about how a Chinese-led New World Order would be. For more than a thousand years, the relationship between China and other nations has been one of a tributary state system with China in the center. Not a system where China engaged with other nations on an equal basis. This is not, this is not trade the way we think about it here in America. In 2052, a large number of countries across the globe will have economies that are China-centered as China will be their main trading partner. This will especially be the case for resource-rich and strategically located countries. China's relationship to these countries will be akin to the historical tributary state system. Now, paying tribute, that's what tributary state system, you have to pay tribute. In other words, if you're going to do business with China, you have to do business with China to survive. And if you do business with China, you have to treat China as though they are the center of the world, the center of the universe. Countries with China-centered economies will be expected to align their foreign policy with China and respect their position in an economic ecosystem revolving around China. In the geographically defined inner circle, we will find neighboring countries. The next sphere of influence will be countries that don't necessarily border China but are closely integrated economically as they serve China. This sphere will constitute the wider circle of partner countries. China will use a wide range of political and economic tools to maximize the integration of these countries and economies into a sinocentric world order that regards China as the center of the world. Also, as China moves into the re reserve currency role, that means that is the currency that the world uses to do business, as China moves into the reserve currency role and as it already holds massive U.S. and world debt, as we've already outlined, its ability to control the world will expand. China will attach political strings to all its business dealings. Countries and corporations won't be able to compete globally or survive without doing business and governing the China way. Not just doing business the Chinese way, but governing the Chinese way which is a strict central government with a godlike leader who must be revered as such and a meritocracy based on Chinese Communist Party standards. People in China and globally will be forced to relocate away from non-sustainable cities. And they'll have to move into pre-built smart cities with the best accommodations made available for those with appropriate social credit scores. Now, the report concludes by saying, In 2052, China will be strongly influencing the world in a distinct manner, culturally, economically, and politically. 
Although China will not be alone, the Chinese civilization will remain particularly distinct and strongly driven by its own internal and historically founded sense of identity and logic. So what's interesting about this is the, the values of the Chinese are in direct contradiction to what is to what the, the globalist, the New World Order says its values are. Unity, oneness, you know, freedom for all, all of this. It, it, so something has to give. Who's, who's actually telling the truth? I don't think Chinese are lying about who they are. It's pretty plain to see. They're barbaric. Okay. So for the, OE, the OECD nations, the ones we described a moment ago, the outlook for this region is similar to the United States. It will be stagnation and decline into greater dependence on China. In the year 2052, these nations will come out better than the U.S. simply due to their position now as leaders in aligning with Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. So if you're on with the sustainable development goals now, the outlook for you in 2052 is much better, uh, you know, relatively speaking. None of these nations were independent superpowers, therefore their decline won't be as dramatic, although their culture and lifestyle will change drastically due to the global's policies and their dependence on China. Okay, what about for the Breeze Nations? Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, and those 10 emerging economies. Indonesia, Mexico, Vietnam, Turkey, Iran, Thailand, Ukraine, Argentina, Venezuela, and Saudi Arabia. These nations and economies account for nearly one-third of the world. They contain massive forests, vast savannas and grasslands, large fertile plains, strong agriculture, strong agriculture, huge manufacturing centers, and a number of megacities. In the years ahead, while China is exploding, these breeze uh, countries will grow much more slowly. One half of the population of these countries, of course, there is India. The breeze countries are in the ideal situation for borrowing technology and solutions from the industrial world, primarily China. That will be the case in a number of breeze countries. By 2052, the gross, the gross domestic product per person will grow from $6,000 to $16,000 per person, which will make the breeze average in 2052 similar to the European average in the 1970s. A great, a great leap, but still too low. The material living standard of, Bree, of the breeze nations will lag the OECD nations by 80 years. Three generations, or, or maybe even four, at least three generations, they'll still be that far behind. And what about the rest? of the world. The most populous of this group is this this region known as the rest of the world. Some of the some of the nation, most populous nations in this group are Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Philippines, Ethiopia, Egypt, Congo, and Myanmar or Burma if you please. This is the least industrialized third of the world and has uh, most of the world's poverty. Jorgen Rogers predicts that these nations where the poverty line of $2 a day was coined, will see growth to $20 a day by 2052. That won't be much comfort given the dominance of China and the inclination of the global elites to lock down and oppress and jab and, and experiment on these people at will, which they've done forever. So in conclusion here for this, the rest of the, the, rest of the world here will remain the poor cousin in the world family. So... Not much change that we'll see here from this group. I love what Summer did with this graphic here. I just have to show it to you. Look at the look at this look at this little one peeking out of the peeking out of the thing here. That's pretty funny. <laughs> like that. Okay, now that brings us to our last segment of the show today. We're right at a little over two hours. I thought that this segment might have to be just a separate show. But hey, I'm kind of a gung-ho guy. I'm kind of all or nothing. And you know that by now if you've been here with us for any amount of time. I, I don't know how to slow down. This is the spiritual, the spirit of the New World Order. 
you know, artificial intelligence and evolution. That's how we look at it today. But, you know, uh, where, where did it come from? Where has, how are these people thinking? Who has influenced and inspired these people? Like Jorgen Reinders, the guy I'm reading to you, the one who has, who predicted 40 years ago, a lot of what we're seeing today, and who is now once again predicting what's going to happen in the next 40 years. Remember, worldview is what we're really concerned with here. That's how we understand what's going to happen. If we know the worldview of the people involved, we can see, we know where they're headed. We know that they're headed for chaos. It's just in, the only question is how soon are they going to get there? So this section of the show is probably going to be uh, clipped out and posted as a separate video at some point here because it's just... I don't know. Uh, this is some some detailed research and detailed reporting about about the spirit underlying this new world order that we see built up around us now. So, near the end of the book 2052 by Jorgen Ronders, there are articles reporting to the Club of Rome about our spiritual future. In a report by Dag Anderson, who is the author of the fifth step, the way to a new society. He said this, one can already discern the emerging characteristics of the next cultural step in the field of human relations, a non-physical phenomenon. A shift this intangible will be feared more than a technological economic change. But the real core of the old paradigm that will be dying in 2052 is the idea that physical material, what we can see with our own eyes, is the only real reality. Currently, thoughts, feelings, and spiritual phenomena are considered side effects subordinated to the physical processes. Well into the next cultural step, once the new perception of reality has taken over, the core of the old paradigm will be expanded to include the non-physical. Phenomena that have been left to religion from Descartes' time will once again become an integrated part of our perception of reality. New religiosity, self-development, and healing are on the way in. Most people already believe in one form of God or another and in life after death. So what will the practical consequences be? The next step is transformational change. People will experience their own existence in a different way. The old paradigm will seem narrow and primitive. A growing constituency has already started on the path toward self-development. For this group, the development of consciousness has become a goal in itself. To mature beyond adulthood. Currently, there is much methodological development, investigation, and experimentation in this area. All sorts of alternatives are being tried out. Many of them from a paradigm well outside that of established scientific order. Most of this methodological development is taking place outside the established research institutions. A great deal will happen over the next 40 years. So what's interesting about this is the prediction that we're going to move out of this era where uh, for, for a while now it seems that atheism, the new atheists, the full horsemen of, of atheism uh, were were rising, and atheism was this popular movement, especially in the, uh, you know, from twenty, from two thousand ten to two thousand fifteen, in that five years, atheists were everywhere, popping up, and they were uh, ch challenging religions and with their logic and reason or secular humanism. All that's going away, they predict. And why is this important? Because as Christians, we need to be aware of the prevailing worldviews around us. We have to be prepared for something that Emilio Ramos at Red Grace Media has called the new apologetics. We have to be able to respond to this new spirituality. 
to be able to respond to it, we got to know where it comes from. Now, there's another piece in the back of 2052. Jonathan Lowe, a zoologist and consultant to the World Wildlife Foundation International, wrote to the Club of Rome this revealing report titled The Third Flowering of the Tree of Life. Now, listen to the point he makes here about evolution. Within the next 40 years, an event will take place that will alter not just the history of our species, but the evolution of life itself. Such events have occurred twice before, but in different ways, and the third time will be different again. To describe these past events and the one to come, I will employ the analogy of the tree of life. This tree sporadically, suddenly, and spectacularly flowers from one of its outer branches. It has done so twice before. The first flowering was the start of the evolution of all multicellular organisms 550 million years ago. And the second marked the beginning of human cultural diversity some 70,000 to 80,000 years ago. A third flowering is about to begin on the outer edge of the tree, leading to a new evolutionary diversification. Now, skipping ahead to Lowe's description of this third flowering of evolution, which he posits will be the awakening of artificial intelligence. So here we get a glimpse into the worldview of those who are on the bleeding edge of this movement. Lowe writes, of course, in biological or cultural evolution, there is no ultimate objective, nor will there be in digital evolution. By 2052, computers will have evolved artificial intelligence and even consciousness. Initially, computers will depend on humans to manufacture them and feed them electricity, but this can increasingly be done by computers themselves. By 2052, the new branches of the Tree of Life will consist of populations of programs, just as the older branches comprise populations of species or languages. But their form or function is not yet clear. So, we face a future in which the two ancient forms of evolutionary diversity diminish while a new one arises. It is not a path we consciously planned or wanted any more than our hominin ancestors chose to become human, or our single-celled ancestors chose to form multicellular species. It will happen simply because a fundamentally new innovation allows massive evolutionary diversification. Where does it leave us? Will we be in control of computer culture? Or will computers come to view humans in the same way we view other species? Interesting useful, even necessary, but essentially a lower life form. So this is interesting right off the top. You see cultural evolution, you know, just, just like, uh, of course, in biological or cultural evolution, there is no ultimate objective, Lowe says. There's no objective. That's worldview. He's telling you his worldview. He is a materialist. But there is no purpose. There is no purpose to the universe. This is, it is all random chance acting, uh, random chance and energy acting on matter. He says that by 2052, computers will have evolved artificial intelligence, will have evolved and even consciousness. So the claim here is that consciousness is life as humans would know it. So the claim here is that computers will have life. Now, in my opinion, that's silly. That's silly. We know how life is created. We know where it comes from. But if you have a worldview that's flawed, that can't answer the big three questions, well, then this is what you're left with. You're left with random, randomness. 
There is no purpose. And so when these computers evolve themselves, we don't know what they'll evolve into. What's dangerous about this is that if you, if you see humanity as purposeless, there is no meaning, we're no different than the animals, well, then it's very easy for you to decide to oppress another person. Now, this sets us up for where we're going now, which is back to these people. Externalization of the hierarchy. We'll take some notes here from the book, The New World Religion by Gary Ka. Let me just share too here with you. This is a book you wanna you wanna have if you wanna understand the spiritual the spirituality of this of the, the world today. Game of Gods by Carl Teichrib. This is not a book you sit down and read at once. This is a reference manual. Um, the Temple of Man and the Age of Reenchantment. This helps us to understand who these people are and what they think, by understanding we can tell where they're headed. Jorgen Reinders has made all kinds of predictions about what's going to happen 40 years from now. That may or may not happen, but what we can do, we know for sure what's going to come of this movement. So we can make extremely accurate predictions. So what is the hierarchy? This religion, this this world movement, this ecumenical movement where all religions are blended into one, where has it come from? Of the major theosophists, Alice Bailey was probably the most instrumental in developing the infrastructure and presenting the strategies of today's New Age movement. By the time she had finished her work in 1949, she had established a number of organizations, including the Lucis Trust. I mean, if you know what that is. She had also compiled 24 books, a total of over 10,000 pages, most of which were allegedly written in a trance state through her spirit guide known as Jual Kul, or the Tibetan. Not coincidentally, Luce's trust was headquartered at the United Nations for many years. Bailey, like her theosophical predecessors, had extremely vicious anti-Christian and anti-Jewish views. Upon examining these writings, one realizes that many of Alice's plans and predictions, all of which were made prior to 1949, are currently coming to fruition. She was far more significant force in modern occultism and in shaping the new world religion than most people realize or would care to admit. After Alice Bailey rejected the Christ of Calvary, she was willing to embrace a different view of Christ presented by a supernatural occult belief system. This doctrinal transformation allowed her to be used for 30 years as a channel for transmitting all that Satan desired humanity to accept as truth. She died on December 15, 1949, just 30 days after she claimed that the Tibetan had finished writing through her. Okay, so that's Bailey. What about these ascended masters, this Tibetan she's talking about? In their own words, the words that are supposedly channeled, the spiritual hierarchy of the earth is the aggregate of those of humanity who have triumphed over matter who have achieved the goal of self-mastery by the same path that individuals tread today. This is Gnosticism. The earliest Christian heresy, Gnosticism, where we, we leave the flesh behind. It's all about the spirit. And salvation comes by special knowledge. They're no longer centered in, these, these uh, ascended masters, are no longer centered in the individual consciousness, but have entered into the wider realization of the planetary group life. They work according to plan and are known as the custodians of the plan. In other words, they claim to be a group of human beings who have experienced the process of reincarnation and are now so highly evolved spiritually that they have somehow gained the right 
and the ability to watch over and guide the progress of humanity. A master of the wisdom is one who has, through self-mastery, achieved mastery over the whole field of human evolution. They each have a special contribution to make towards human progress in one of the seven major fields of world work. Political, religious, educational, scientific, philosophical, uh, psychological, and economic. Remember the seven mountain mandate from the New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, New Age occultists refer to these spirits by a variety of names, including spirit guide, guide, instructor, advisor, director, master, enlightened one, adept, initiated, uh, hierarchy of initiates, spiritual hierarchy of the earth, planetary hierarchy, the hierarchy of uh, Ubermenschen, and custodians of the plan. The most powerful or highest ranking members of this so-called hierarchy are known as Ascended Masters of the Wisdom. Ascended Masters, the Tibetan Masters, or simply just Masters, all are references to the same beings. Now, the Tibetan Master of Alice Bailey, uh, Jual Kul, allegedly explained his own existence directly to Alice Bailey. Bailey published his explanation in several of her books, including the externalization of the hierarchy. Now, let me stop for a second. Why is this important? Uh, think about people like Lucian Tarnowski, who we've talked about here before. A lot of these people, uh, especially when they're coming out of Europe, this seems to be extremely a rich tradition of this. These people have a very specific religion. It all seems like it's relative, uh, that their religion is, is, is relative to the person, but it's all, it all has some very important elements uh, in common. This is the core of what the people pushing, the globalist unit, uh, movement for unity and oneness, this is, this, is their, this is their spirituality, this is their religion. And we'll show you some extremely interesting details in just a minute. New Agers accept, it is understood, that these beings are able to communicate telepathically with those individuals who open themselves up to their enlightened teachings. And you can bet that those people putting together the sustainable development goals at some level have received them this way. Because they, they mirror, I mean, they, they echo exactly what we hear here. Gary Kaw writes, I believe that at some point, Theosophy's most advanced occultists, such as Blavatsky and Bailey, realized that these beings were actually demonic spirits serving uh, were actually demonic spirits serving Lucifer. Why does he say that? Because there are too many references to Lucifer in their writings for anything else to have been the case. Lucis trust. But whatever the explanation occultists give for the existence of these beings, the impact is always the same. People are led away from God's truth by accepting the false hope that they too can overcome death and be as gods. So the genesis of transhumanism and the, the false environmentalist movement, Agenda 21, can be found very plainly right here. What is the plan of the hierarchy? Well, Jesus Christ is sometimes portrayed by the hierarchy as being one of the ascended masters or one of the Christs. But they present Buddha with this title as well and place him in a superior position. They tell us that Christ came to show us the love of God, but Buddha came to bring us enlightenment. They go out of their way to suggest that the Bible has been misinterpreted and its true meaning lost through the centuries. But they claim that this has never happened to the sacred scriptures of the East, so they can still be trusted. The hierarchy has revealed to occultists that the teachings intended to, continue to, that the teachings intended to condition the world 
for the New Age, also known as the Aquarian Age or the New World Order, fall into three categories. Number one, preparatory, given from 1875 to 1890, written down by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Number two, intermediate, given from 1919 to 1949, written down by Alice Bailey. And number three, revelatory, emerging after 1975 to be revealed on a worldwide scale via the radio, television, meaning that some of the major film producers and scriptwriters, as well as television personalities, whether they be politicians, religious leaders, or merely paid actors, would have to be tapped into the same occult forces and be privy to the same demonic enlightenment as their predecessors at the Theosophical Society. The Work of the Hierarchy Lucis Trust describes the patient strategy of the occult hierarchy this way. Hierarchical work is so quietly and smoothly developed and so effectively expressive of expanding human consciousness that when it is well advanced, it appears quite natural and reasonable. Right? Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't all the things that the, uh, that the globalists, the, uh, the uh, people at the UN, they, they, the things they say, it just it sounds reasonable. We all want peace, right? That's reasonable. Here's quite natural and reasonable. What about the teachings? What do they teach? Let's see if what we can find out that these, these ascended masters teach, does it sound anything like what we hear from Agenda 21 or the United Nations today or the World Government Summit last week? There are four pillars upon which the New Age movement is built. The writings of the Tibetan through Alice Bailey reinforce all four. These pillars are evolution, reincarnation, astrology, and occult meditation. In her unfinished autobiography, Alice Bailey states, All evolutionary development in all fields is an expression of divinity, and the static condition of theological interpretation is contrary to the great law of the universe, which is evolution. Occultists and pantheists almost universally use the theory of evolution to explain away the existence of a personal creator, suggesting that humanity is part of an evolving God force. Now, last week, and for a couple shows uh, last week, or the past two or three weeks, we dealt with something called Gnostic Darwinism, where evolution and Gnosticism are blended together. And that's what we see here. This is another example of that. That is, that is the spiritual state of those uh, who believe they control the world today, the powers that think they be. Reincarnation they teach as well, is a demonic substitute for the resurrection promised to all who belong to Jesus Christ. One of the 24 books dictated by the Tibetan is Esoteric Astrology. Seeking guidance through the stars and planets is Satan's substitute for the guidance of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life. Now, when you look into the background of these people like Lucian Tarnowski, and many of these young global leaders, you see that they are very much into astrology. They rely on it heavily to make their decisions. And not only that, meditation is huge among this group. The Tibetan also placed a great important uh, the, the Tibetan also placed a great importance on the New Age practice of meditation. The Tibetan said this in a channeled session. The science of meditation as mind training, technique, and concentration, and invocation will become increasingly practiced in the West. You got that right. Transcendental meditation, forms of yoga, and other centering techniques are now being taught to our children even in some public schools. Virtual reality is another new technology attempting to fuse science with spiritual occult phenomena. 
and can automatically induce altered states of consciousness, hypnotic trances. Researchers are dubbing this technology the LSD of the future. So here we find ourselves in another uh, cultural transformation like occurred in the 60s. But the implements are a little different now. It's technological rather than pharmacological. The biblical concept of meditation means to think about or to dwell upon. It involves an active thought process. This is far different from the Eastern meditation, which puts the mind into a passive, neutral, trance state open to any spiritual forces that choose to enter. Now, what about global citizens in this new world religious order? Romans 16, verse 18 says, By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of native people. The environmental crisis, although paramount to the purposes of the globalist movement, is not the only reason given to justify the creation of a new world order. The need for a more stable and equitable international financial system, the push to eliminate global hunger and disease, and the quest for lasting world peace are all key arguments in advancing this occult agenda. If the public could be unified around these critical issues, the level of cooperation necessary to achieve a planetary shift in consciousness might finally be realized. What about education in the New World Order? In order to achieve their new planetary civilization, globalists understood early on that they would have to influence the world's educational systems. Only by re-educating our youth to embrace a new set of cosmic values referred to as the global ethic, pay attention to that, that name, pay attention to that word, the global ethic, only through that could their political efforts succeed. The United Nations embarked on a vigorous campaign to replace traditional Western curricula which had promoted a strong sense of national identity and a Christian ethic. They proposed a new international curriculum promoting the concepts of world government and pantheistic religion. This new curriculum, it was hoped, would turn children into global citizens who would not only embrace the new order, but also would actively work to help bring it about. Then, of course, there is the World Core Curriculum. Now, early on in the channel here, it did lots of work on uh, Robert Mueller, which was the, the grandfather of what we call today Common Core. At first, it was called World Core Curriculum. The World Core Curriculum sets forth the principles that are to govern all of the planet's education programs. The fact is, today's major education reforms were set in motion by the United Nations in the 1980s. After gaining the support of key members, the Bush and Clinton administrations, they have carefully and systematically been introduced at the state and local, level, uh, local levels where they're now receiving widespread support. So, as you can see, this is a bipartisan uh, effort. In the Apostle Paul's letter, let's get these guys off here for a minute for you. In the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy, chapter 4, he advises the young evangelist to be aware of those who will come specifically to lead God's people into error. The Holy Spirit explicitly and unmistakably declares that in the latter times some will turn away from the faith, paying attention instead to deceitful, seductive spirits and doctrines of demons, misled by the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared, as with a branding iron, leaving them incapable of ethical functioning. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Paul especially marked this 
as a revolution. Paul especially marked this as a revelation from the Holy Spirit that certain dangers would mark these times. The danger of apostasy, some will depart. The danger of deception, deceiving spirits. The danger of false teaching, doctrines of demons. Even apostolic times, the world seemed to be rushing to an end. This was almost 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul wrote this. As it turns out, the latter times describe a broad era, not just a couple of years. Not just a couple of decades, but a broad era. Departing or turning away from the faith means to literally deny truth. But what truth are we talking about here? Truth, first and foremost, means the essential teachings of the Christian faith. When some depart from the faith, they are abandoning the essential teachings of Christianity. This is why the unbelieving world is so confused. They've turned away from the foundation of all truth. The Bible uses the phrase, the faith, in this way, in many places throughout the Scripture. to stand for the foundation of all truth. Deceiving spirits refers to demonic spirits, angelic beings who have rebelled against God, who seek to deceive men and women and to entice them away from the truth. Doctrines of demons refers to the specific teachings of these deceiving spirits. Demons are theology majors and have systems of doctrine. We find the first demonic doctrine in Genesis chapter 3. There, Satan speaking through a serpent taught Eve, You will not surely die, because God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Since then, every demonic doctrine has found its way back to this root. The idea that we can be gods or that we can operate independently from God. That we can be autonomous beings. One theologian said, Deception has her spirits of every kind, which she employs to darken the hearts and destroy the souls of men. Pretenders to inspiration and false teachers of every kind belong to this class. Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons have been around since man first walked the Garden of Eden. But we should expect that more and more people in the church would depart from the faith in the latter times and accept these false teachings. Our job is so crucial today because modern technology is better able to spread the lie faster than ever before and more people within the church are following these doctrines of demons thinking that it is truth. The spirituality of globalism is in direct contradiction to the revealed Word of God, which is the Scriptures. It has its modern roots in the movement of the Theosophical Society, for one, whose doctrines have established complete false religions, but have also slithered on their belly into the church. And that is why we see things like this. The House of One, Berlin soon to become host, poem to something truly unique, Jews, Christians, and Muslims are planning to build a house of worship here, one that brings a synagogue, a church, and a mosque together under one roof. The three separate sections will be linked by a communal room in the center of the building. This will serve as a meeting place where worshipers and members of the public can come together and learn more about the religions and each other. So we can see all of this coming to fruition around us.
The level of unity necessary to establish a new world order would ultimately require cooperation between the world's major religions. Religious leaders would somehow have to become tolerant of each other's beliefs, or at the very least refrain from denouncing one another's doctrines. Interfaithism, the concept that all religions are valid and are merely different pathways to God, would have to become the dominant view. Unity cannot be achieved without a one-world government and a one-world religion, according to to the order. A one world ecumenical system that is in line with the occult mandates of Alice Bailey and among others Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. The seeds for the 20th century ecumenism were sown in the late 1800s. During that time, there was a growing interest in achieving unity for the alleged purpose of building an earthly utopia. Masonic-inspired organizations ranging from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn to the Theosophical Society were busy laying the groundwork for the next century, which they hoped might finally usher in their long-awaited new world order. Religious leaders from around the world gathered in Chicago for an unprecedented ecumenical event, the 1893 Parliament of the World Religions. Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Roman Catholics, Protestants, and a host of others prayed and dialogued together for 17 days. Even the Theosophical Society was represented by Annie Besant. This was the largest interfaith leadership conference in the history of the world up to that time. In the following decades, two catastrophic world wars were fought, each adding to the one world movement's momentum. World War I resulted in the creation of the League of Nations, and World War II led to the United Nations. Both were created in the name of world peace. Riding this crest of Post-war sentiment, global planners seized the moment, attempting to unite the Protestant denominations through one organization. Although the spirit of ecumenism had been alive for decades, the founding of the pro-United Nations World Council of Churches in 1948 marked the beginning of the modern ecumenical, ecumenical era. Strongly influenced by the Masonic Lodge and with funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, the World Council of Churches aggressively embarked on its mission. Its purpose was clear, to help create the religious atmosphere for achieving a new world order. Today, from its headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, the World Council on Churches continues to provide important leadership. No event would give greater momentum to the ecumenical movement than Vatican II. The 21st Ecumenical Council, called Vatican II or the Second Vatican Council, which opened on October 11, 1962 at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, added fuel to the growing ecumenical movement and helped pave the way for the acceptance of interfaithism. The Council urged all Christians to act positively, to preserve and even promote all that is in all that is good in other religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and other world religions. Years later, Pope John Paul II would take the Council's initiatives a step further by holding an actual interfaith summit in Assisi, Italy. This 1986 gathering consisted of leaders from the world's major religions and initiated by the Pope himself would represent a visible transition from traditional ecumenism to the new interfaithism. Now, these terms are often interchangeably used today, but historically, the word ecumenism has been viewed as an effort aimed at unifying Christian churches. Interfaithism, on the other hand, was always perceived as a broader attempt to unify all of the world's religions.
One of the most, uh, uh, once most of Christendom uh, had been brought together under a false spiritual unity, it was thought that Christianity might be prepared to go the next step by merging with other religions. And that brings us to the 1993 Parliament of World Religions. This is where it gets interesting. The 1993 Parliament of World Religions was a plan for the world's spiritual future. Besides the major religions and well-known spiritual traditions, some of those presented described themselves as Catholic Quaker, Celtic, blends of the many, interreligious, or Hindu theosophy. Also in attendance were voodoo and druid priests, Freemasons, Wiccans, witches, snake charmers, Zoroastrian sun worshippers, representatives of Lucis Trust, and an assortment of other occultists and Luciferians. The World Council, the Parliament of the World's Parliament of the World's Religions. Here we see now. <laughs> this is what's. It says here about the, the people that were on their board of directors that they had, let's just look at what their board of directors looks like today uh, to see has this, uh, has this movement changed its ways. Well, let's look at who's on the board of directors, the parliament here of uh, world religions. Their board of trustees, the uh, parliament of world religions started in uh, 1993. Who's on their board of trustees today? If we're talking about a movement, what should a Christian think about this? Is what we're getting. Is this actually a good religious movement? The Parliament of the World Religions. Let's just see. Can two walk together lest they agree? For a spiritual purpose. There is no neutrality. Remember, that's what we established right from the start today. There is no such thing as neutrality when it comes to moral issues, to spiritual issues. Well, we see right here off the top, there's plenty. I don't, I, a lot of these are Buddhists and Sikhs, um, rabbis, and, uh, and all of these people have connections in uh, Agenda 21. This, this lady here, a, uh, she's a member of the Forbes 30 Under 30, Climate Reality Mentor, for example. And we get down here to, we've got Muslims, and we've got this lady here. This uh, lady here. Phyllis Curat is one of America's first public Wiccan priestesses. An attorney and author whose groundbreaking books published in 14 countries, made Wicca accessible to the world and awakened an entire generation to the goddess. How about that? Named one of the 10 gutsiest women of the year by Jane Magazine, she was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Collegium of Clergy and Scholars. New York Magazine declared Curat's teaching the culture's next big idea. Her YouTube series on Wicca has more than a million views. Widely covered in the international media, Time recently published her challenge to the world's faiths to lead the way in the fight for the human rights and dignity of women as one of America's leading voices. She was the vice chair of the 2015 Parliament of the World Religions and creator of the historic 2015 inaugural Women's Assembly. She's a founder of Temple of Ara, the world's oldest shamanic Wiccan congregation. Kirat received her degree in philosophy from Brown University. And these are her, her letters. So there's a Wiccan priestess here, uh, Mary Doak. She's from the University of Chicago. She's a professor of theology. Uh, what about the second page? What else do we have? So a Catholic priest here. So the Catholic priest has no problem uh, working on spiritual matters alongside a Wiccan priestess. Uh, working alongside the, the Sikhs. 
Here's Caleb Nyquist, a, a strategist for organizations working at the intersection of sustainability, spirituality, and democratic reform. He is an evangelical. All right, so he was uh, from 2012 to 2019, he oversaw the growth of youth evangelicals for climate action as a steering committee member and civic engagement chair. He's done research on faith-based refugee settlement in Sweden, funded by Baptist Theological Union. Congregational responses to ecological despair in the United States, and on and on. Climate change. So here, this evangelical Christian has no problem working alongside in spiritual endeavors with a Wiccan priestess and various uh, others. Attorneys, this man is a, uh, a, a Dharmist. He's trained in Dharma. James A. Lynch Jr. is a Dharma teacher authorized by the lay Buddhist organization. Here's one, uh, Charlene Manuel, an ordained Unity minister, serving as Senior Minister of Unity Center of Miami for the past 20 years. In addition to seminary studies, uh, Charlene holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Sociology and Urban Studies, Master's of Arts in Human Resources Development, active in peace work, uh, taking delegations to study at the University for Peace in Costa Rica. What's interesting is this, this is a Unity minister, a Unity minister. They deny all of the basics of the essentials of Christianity, so we can't call it Christian, but it's definitely spiritual. So do we see other Christians teaming up here? We do, we do. So we see a big problem with the modern Christian church. Here's Dr. Kusumita Peterson, Professor Emerita of Religious Studies at St. Francis College and chair of the Interfaith Center of New York, also a member of the Climate Action Task Force of the Parliament of World Religions and of the Climate Working Group of the Committee of Religious Non-Governmental Organizations at the United Nations, co-author of Global Ethics in Practice, and on and on. And uh, we move on down here, uh, more, more traditional... Uh, Jewish, Buddhist, Sikh, and here we have the Christian. For three decades, it's Dr. Scott Stearman. For three decades, Dr. Scott Stearman has served as a pastor in the Christian Baptist tradition. His experience includes congregations in Athens, Greece, and in Paris, France, he represents the Baptist global body at the United Nations. He is active in advocacy at the high-level political forum around the United Nations Agenda 2030, also known as the Sustainable Development Goals. I repeat, Christian Baptist tradition. Okay, so what we're pointing out here to you is that the ecumenical movement has been largely a success. Christians see no problem in yoking up spiritually with Wiccan priestess. All right. That brings us next to this uh, Sir John Templeton and the Templeton Prize. All right. The Templeton Prize is an annual award granted to a living person in the estimation of the judges whose exemplary achievements advance Sir John Templeton's philanthropic vision. Okay. One of the highlights of the Parliament, this Parliament of uh, World Religions 1993, was the awarding of the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. Valued at $1.2 million, it is the world's most prestigious and lucrative ecumenical award. The International Prize is bestowed annually upon the individual perceived to be the most outstanding religious figure of the year. That's essentially what it is. Or, or as it said here, the person whose uh, achievements advance Sir John Templeton's philanthropic vision. His vision. All right. Historically, um, uh, Christian leaders who have received the award 
Christian leaders who have received this one world, this award from this one world religious religion movement. Well, sadly, there's Billy Graham. 1982, Billy Graham received the Templeton Prize. And in 1996, here is Bill Bright receiving the Templeton Prize. What's wrong with that? What's, what's wrong with uh, Billy Graham? If you asked Billy Graham, would he yoke up spiritually with a Wiccan priestess? What would he say? Well, he wouldn't say anything now. But what would he have said? What would, um, what was our other guy there? The token Christian. What, what would uh, Dr. Scott Stearman from, from, from the Baptist tradition, what, what would he say? Is, is it okay to yoke up spiritually? We, no, we're just working for peace. No, that's not what this organization is. This organization has a clear goal, and we'll tell you about that in just a minute. But here is Billy Graham. Here is Bill Bright. Bill Bright is the the founder of uh, Campus Crusade. Campus Crusade for Christ, it's now known as Crew. It is the most prominent, the most, uh, the largest uh, campus ministry, uh, maybe in the world. It's on uh, almost all college campuses now, and uh, it's, it's problematic today in what it teaches. There is no, there is no, you, you can't you can't find out what 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 do we actually believe is is did, did Jesus actually exist is Jesus God do we do we affirm the Trinity did, these things are all nebulous you can't you don't know for sure so it's ecumenical it's yoking up with the rest of the world the first Templeton Prize went to uh, in 1973 to Mother Teresa. Uh, within the pe people who have won this award have been people from Eastern religions, people from the Charismatic Renewal Movement. That would be Bill Bright, for one. Um, Buddhists, a, Benedic a Benedictine monk, Muslims, Hindus, rabbis. Uh, Pandurang Shastri Athavali, founder of the leader of the Bhagavad Gita based self study known as Swadayaya which incorporates self-worship, won the prize in 1997. Sir John Templeton, after whom the award is named, serves on the Parliament's Board of Trustees and has been closely linked to the Rockefeller family fortune. Who has won the Templeton Prize? Who else? Let's, we saw Billy Graham and Bill Bright. Well, these are, okay, well, let's... We've got a theoretical, theoretical physicist, a geneticist, one in 2020. Jane Goodall won last year. For some of you who know who this is, this, for me, this is very interesting. Alvin Plantinga, philosopher. One of the most well-known, uh, he's well-known for his, his work in Christian apologetics. Specifically in uh, theodicy, the problem of evil. Why does evil exist? Well, I, it's just, I don't, how could you accept this award? If you know what this organization is and what, what the goals are, if you're paying attention at all, how could you have your face on their website? If you're a Bible believing Christian, here's uh Desmond Tutu. I'm not, look, I'm not just trying to say just because he's on here with Desmond Tutu. No, you have to affirm some of these standards. You have to, you've been given this award because you are advancing Sir John Templeton's philanthropic vision. And what is that? It is a one world religion. So Alvin Plantinga, Desmond Tutu, who uh, died recently and is, was uh, in press uh, talking about his uh, water cremation, very sustainable <laughs> way to dispose of a body. Anyway, so, uh, and here is uh, uh, Thomas Hollick, Catholic priest. So the ecumenical movement is 
quite successful. Of course, so-called His Holiness, Tenzin Gyatso, the fourth Dalai Lama. Right? Do, do we hold the same spiritual values as the Dalai Lama? Well, everyone on this page holds the same spiritual value. One world religion. They're all, there are many ways to God. So, uh, what about the global ethic? What do they mean by that? In the 1993 parliament was uh, the convening of an inner circle of interfaith religious authorities. Interfaith religious authorities. The assembly of religious and spiritual leaders developing a consensus for how people should behave. That's what the organization does. They condemn the abuse, the quote, abuses of Earth's ecosystems, poverty, and social injustice. The ethic, the global ethic, if accepted, would represent an irrevocable, unconditional norm for all areas of life, for families and communities, for races, nations, and religions. This is what you, right, this is what you represent if you allow yourself, you know, to be to be classed with uh, these folks, with this interfaith organization. If you're representing Christianity on uh, here, well, I don't know how you can. Can two walk together lest they agree? It's not, there, there, there is no neutral ground when it comes to, to doctrine. Global Responsibility, in his book, Global Responsibility in Search of a New World Ethic, uh, Mr. Kung makes clear that participation in this new ethic, this new religion, will not be optional. So essentially what this organization promotes is a new religion. So how can you be a Christian and affiliate with this? The ecumenical movement, the interfaith movement, is strong. In this book, In Search of the New World Ethic, it says, any form of church conservatism is to be rejected. To put it bluntly, no, re no regressive or repressive religion, whether Christian, Islamic, Jewish, or of whatever provenance, has a long-term future. What we need is an ecumenical world order. How can Alvin Planting find himself here? How can Billy Graham find himself here? I know people say many things about Graham, you know, Mace and all that. I don't know. I don't know about that. But I see him here. And this is a big problem. Because to align with this group means that you want to see an ecumenical world order, an interfaith world order. To align yourself with this group means that you believe church conservatism is to be rejected. That no repressive, regressive uh, religion, whether Christian, Islamic, or Jews, Christianity can't be accepted. So how can you align with this group? The global ethic. Which was signed by Robert Mueller and the other interfaith dignitaries present is emerging as a companion to the Earth Charter, the 1992 Earth Charter came from Rio, that's where we got Agenda 21, is expected to be, to religion, what the Charter is, what the UN Charter is to international politics. Together, these documents are destined to impact and shape the future religious and political course of mankind. God, of course, has already given us a set of global ethics as part of his created order. Man would rather create his own set of rules catering to his personal wants and desires than to submit to God's authority. Even well-known, beloved Christians we find in this movement. The fallen nature of man seems inclined to rally around any system that promises salvation and earthly utopia without repentance. 
without accountability to a personal God. That's what this movement is. How can you find yourself here if you're a Christian who believes what God has said in His revealed Word? So as we see here on this uh, global ethic, global ethic is a landmark declaration of the Parliament of World Religions stating the universal values and principles shared by the world religions, spiritual and cultural traditions. The global ethic is a statement of basic ethical commitment shared by people throughout the globe, religious or not. So salvation comes through a global ethic, not through, not through the cross. The global ethic responds to an urgent practical need as well as a deep spiritual hunger for clear moral guidance on the most fundamental issues of human life and conduct. It expresses a minimal set of principles for committed action in a world torn by violence, religious and racial hatred, oppression of women and minority groups, extremes of wealth and poverty, and the growing threat of climate change and destruction of the natural world. A major achievement of the global ethic is to demonstrate that there is agreement on these issues. It recognizes that beyond legislated laws and conventions, there must be changes in people's minds, hearts, and ways of life. This is religion. It says a major achievement of the global ethic is to demonstrate that there is agreement on all these issues. Everyone here agrees that we need a one world religion. How can you find yourself here, Dr. Plantinga? Why? The Parliament of the World's Religions calls all people, religious or not, to commit themselves to the values and principles of a global ethic. The Parliament also calls for people all over the world to signal their support for the global ethic by signing it. Here are the principles. Commitment to a culture of nonviolence and respect for life. Commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. Commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness. Let's just stop on that one for a minute. Commitment to a culture of tolerance. What does that mean? That means we have to put our doctrine aside. We have to put truth aside and allow all these other truths to be seen as equal. That's confusion. Commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women. Commitment to a culture of sustainability and care for the earth. That's the movement. So we've shown where it came from and where it is today. It's still the same doctrine of demons that it always was. What about the Vatican? What about the Catholic connection? The direct involvement of the United Nations in this project has been evident from the beginning. Reverend William Swing of Grace Episcopal Church in San Francisco has become the initiative's figurehead and spokesperson. This book was written in the 90s, by the way, so he may be passed by now. The direct involvement of the United Nations in this project has been evident from the beginning. Swing relates how the United Nations first contacted him in 1993 about heading a worship celebration on its behalf. The United Nations wanted a worship celebration. Lest anyone tell you that you're crazy or a conspiracy theorist, if you think the United Nations is a religious organization, they think they are. They call themselves one. The United Religious Organization is, is intended to be to religion what the United Nations has become to global politics. Unifying the world's religions as the United Nations is unifying the world's nations. The United Religious Religions Initiative, if successful, will be a spiritual United Nations. And it has been successful. Toward this end, proponents of the UR initiative, operating under the framework of the global ethic, are preparing a detailed United Religious Charter outlining the world's religious future. Its headquarters in San Francisco at the Presidio, 
home of the satanic church as well, uh, just saying, and, and psychological operations unit of the arm. I don't know. It's just a lot of weird things at the Presidio. Along with the Gorbachev Foundation, after receiving the call from the United Nations, uh, Swing set out to organize the United Nations 50th anniversary worship service as planned. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, during the service, prayers, chants, and incantations were offered to a dozen deities. And we see that here also in this article from catholicculture.org. The One World Church expected this year. This is from 1997 following this event we're reading about here. Prayers, chants, and incantations were offered to a dozen different deities. The plans for the United uh, Religions Organization of One World Church is about to become institutionalized. Collaborating our Episcopalian Bishop William Swing, the Gorbachev Foundation, certain leaders of the Catholic Church. But it says here about this worship ceremony, uh, these, they, were, uh, they were prayed to at least a dozen deities. Also, children from around the world mingled over 30 sacred waters in a great bowl of unity. This ritual was performed, this ritual was performed to the accompaniment, accompaniment music from the earth-worshipping Missa Gaia. This pagan setting would become the platform for Swing to formally present his plan for united religions. It was interesting, this article from Catholic culture here. They're just recounting what happened here. They don't seem to have a problem with it. Uh, one of the long-standing goals of the Masonic New World Order seems finally within grasp. It's one world church in the making for, uh, making for over 150 years. Is about to become institutionalized as the United Religions Organization, or the UR. So, you know, they're just going to say exactly what we've already shown here. I just wanted to show you another, another connection out there where someone else has written about it, and this is coming out of catholicculture.org. They do seem to be calling, expressing some kind of horror at what they see happening here. And, of course, uh, Vatican Connection. Swing hosting a global interfaith summit in June 1996. The summit's purpose was to further United Religions initiative and determine how to deal with expected resistance. Like for those of us who might say, hey, wait a minute. You're, n you're not Christian at all. The conference held in San Francisco was co-sponsored by the Gorbachev Foundation and the World Conference on Religion and Peace, the WCRP an organization with strong Catholic representation. Now, uh, a lot of people have heard of the Gorbachev Foundation, the United Nations, of course, and Robert M Mueller, but very few individuals are even aware of the world, um, this World Council, this World Conference on Religion and Peace. Yet it is a major player in the global interfaith community. The World Conference on Religion and Peace started in 1970 with Angelo Fernandez, the Catholic Archbishop of New Delhi, India, serving as its first head as a United Nations non-governmental organization. It worked closely with the UN and its various agencies. Among its plans is an international center for conflict resolution funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. The first session of the 6th General Assembly, Assembly in 1994 was hosted by the Vatican. Speakers included Hans Kung, Milan's Cardinal Martini, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and Roger Cardinal Echgaray, chief organizer of the Pope's 1986 Assisi Interfaith Meeting. The Defend Life magazine reported, according to uh, inside the Vatican, the Pope listened to Quranic verses in Jewish as well as Shinto, Buddhist, and Hindu invocations for peace. The conference's final declaration affirmed the sacredness of the earth and our unity with it. So the global ethic. It is a decree. It's providing the basic spiritual framework for the emerging world religion with the United Religions Charter laying out the specific details. 
The Earth Charter, on the other hand, is providing the political foundation for the emerging world government. So we have the two parts. We have, we have the secular climate change movement and the religious uh, spiritual movement all coming together as one for one movement. With the UN Charter as a possible world constitution spelling out the details for implementation. At the center of this alliance between politics and religion are the Gorbachev Foundation and the Vatican. And as Robert Mueller said, speaking at the Parliament of World Religions, don't worry if not all religions well join the United Religious Organization. Many nations didn't join the, U the UN at its beginning, but later regretted it and made every effort to join. It was the same with the European community, and it will be the case with the world's religions, because whoever stays out or aloof will sooner or later regret it. That brings us here. The World Health Organization and Religions for Peace Global Conference. So all we've, we've laid out for you from the past, from the externalization of the hierarchy, where it all started in the modern age anyway, right up to now it, is, it has grown and it has become what it was intended to be. Here you see, here you see the mixture of the United Nations and a global religion, the World Health Organization, in fact, and Religions for Peace Global Conference, strengthening national responses to health emergencies. World Health Organization, religious leaders, faith-based organizations, faith communities, and national governments. This global conference convened representatives of national governments, faith partners, uh, World Health uh, Organization offices and other stakeholders facilitate, it facilitated the exchange of experiences and uh, lessons learned, identify and collated good practice examples of collaboration between churches and governments during the COVID-19 pandemic to inform response to future public health emergencies and further expanded the multidisciplinary network of faith partners to continue to grow and expand their influence among the religious, especially Protestants, because you have to get Protestants because we're, we're, we're not easily won over to global religion, so you have to compel it somehow. That brings us to the final section. Where, where is it all headed? Where is it going? Ultimately, where it's headed, if look, we've been able to chart this right from the start all the way through its development right up until today and see that it, it not only has existed and remained, it has grown into what they said it would be. Where's it headed? Global spirituality and the destruction of and redefinition of Christianity. This message... I can't, I can't not do it. I got to get Waj cool up here. Yeah, there he is. Uh, because this message I'm about to read you from Alice Bailey came from the Tibetan himself, Jual Kool, according to Alice Bailey. And, you know, who are, who are we to deny that she was visited by a a demon, right? There we go. There he is. That's a depiction of him anyway. This guy didn't exist, but if he did, the idea was that this, this human, this idea of a human was telepathically communicating to Alice Bailey from deep inside India, she'd never met him, and giving her all of these ideas. Of course, this was, uh, this was a demon, or Satan himself. But here is what was channeled 
supposedly to Alice Bailey about where all this will go. Everything she said and everything this character was supposed to have channeled to her has come to fruition. Where's it headed? Alice Bailey and Lucis Truss have had a long history of promoting ideas that run contrary to the historical teachings of Orthodox Christianity and Jews. She tries to explain away the atoning work of Jesus on the cross by teaching that man is divine and doesn't need redemption. What is further distressing is how she refers to Jews and Bible-believing Christians as belonging to the forces of darkness. In short, she turns the truth upside down, calling good evil and evil good. Essentially, that's what this entire interfaith movement does. If you claim certainty, if you claim there's only one way to the Father, you're in darkness, they say. According to her doctrine, humans are simply gods in the making who can attain Christ consciousness. This belief is particularly appealing to pantheists. But according to Bailey, the Christ also has a second, more esoteric meaning, which she reveals on page 558 of the externalization of the hierarchy. She says, the Christ, this, she got this from this figure here. The Christ works for all men, irrespective of their faith. He does not belong to the Christian world any more than to the Buddhist, the Mohammedan, the Muslim, or any other faith. There is no need for any man to join the Christian church in order to be affiliated with Christ. Said the demon. Think about that if you're someone who thinks we're a little too pushy about going to church. Right? The demon said, there is no need for any man to join the Christian church in order to be affiliated with Christ. The requirements are to love your fellow men, lead a disciplined life, recognize the divinity in all faiths and all beings, and rule your daily life with love. What this message is, is Antichrist. It is the inverted truth. The truth inverted, I should say. So what is the plan? Where is all this heading? In a channeled session, through Alice Bailey, this character was supposed to have said this. All the other stuff he was supposedly channeled through came to pass. He says, the hierarchy is deeply concerned over world events. That which is old and undesirable must go, and of these undesirable things, hatred and the spirit of separation must be the first to go. That means that no truth, because truth divides, therefore it must be all unified. It's unity, regardless of truth. The channeled session continues, We must institute the new social order and a more inclusive Regime. What do we know about Christianity? Christianity is exclusive. This character calls for an inclusive regime. No doctrine. The men who inspired the initiating French Revolution, the great conqueror Napoleon Bismarck, the great, the, the great conqueror Napoleon, Bismarck, the creator of a nation, Mussolini, the regenerator of his people, Hitler, who lifted a distressed people upon his shoulders, right, that's, that's what, Lenin, the idealist, Stalin and Franco are all expressions of the Shambhala force and of certain, they are little understood energies. The channeled session continues, we call these people dictators, demagogues, inspired leaders, or just and wise men. But all these leaders are, in the last analysis, highly developed personalities. They are being used to engineer great and needed changes and to alter the face of civilization. They are the agents of destiny, the creators of the new order, and the initiators of the new civilization. They are the destroyers of what must be destroyed before humanity can go forward along the lighted way. It continues, I write for the generation which will come at the end of this century. They will inaugurate the framework, structure, and fabric of the new age. He's talking about, he's talking about now, he's probably talking about at the end uh, 
before 1999, that century. But he's talking about the people who are here today. The will of the individual will voluntarily be blended into group will. The new world will be built upon the ruins of the old. The new structure will rise. And the destruction and redefinition of Christianity. Joel Cool was supposed to have said this, according through Alice Bailey. I refer to that period which will surely come in which an enlightened people will rule. These people will not tolerate authoritarianism in any church. That means no truth. They will not accept or permit the rule of any body of men who undertake to tell them what they must believe in order to be saved. So you're, you, you, you create it in yourself. Whatever you think is right is right, according to this demon. World unity will be a fact when the children of the world are taught that religious differences are largely just a matter of birth. You're born in one country. You're born in Italy. You'll be a Catholic. You're born in um, Israel. You'll be a Jew. If you're uh, born in the Middle East, you'll be a Muslim. If you're born in the East, you'll be a Buddhist. That's the idea. If you're born in America, you'll be a Protestant. That's what they say. But that's... That commits the genetic fallacy. Thus, gradually, our quarrels and differences will be offset, and the idea of the one humanity will take their place. He continues and says this. This is where you can see that what you're hearing here is just pure Gnosticism. Rehashed the original Christian heresy of the first century, now repackaged and presented for today. He says, up till now the mark of the Savior has been the cross. And the quality of the salvation offered has been freedom from the substance or the lure of matter and from its hold. That's Gnosticism. The future holds within its silence other modes of saving humanity. There are other ways to salvation, he says. The cup of sorrow and the agony of the cross are well nigh finished. Joy and strength will take their place. Instead of sorrow, we shall have joy, which will work out in happiness and lead eventually to bliss. That's the father of lies speaking, my friends. Right? When they say the future holds within its silence other modes of salvation, the cup of sorrow and the agony of the cross are finished. That's your adversary, Satan, speaking through Alice Bailey here. There is, as you well know, no angry God, no hell, and no vicarious atonement. And the only hell is the earth itself, where, uh, where we learn to work out our own salvation. Gnosticism. The demon goes on through Alice Bailey to say, Jehovah is not God. And these erroneous ideas die out. The concept of hell will fade from man's recollection, and its place will be taken by an understanding of the law, which makes each man work out his own salvation, which leads him to right the wrongs which he may have perpetrated in his lives on earth, and which enables him eventually to clean his own slate. It can be expected that the Orthodox Christian will at first reject the theories about the Christ which occultism presents. A Christ who is present and living is what we offer, he says. A Christ who is known to those who follow him, who is a strong and able executive and not a sweet, sentimental sufferer. Who has, this Christ has never left us, but who has worked for 2,000 years through the medium of His disciples, the inspired men and women of all faiths, who has no use for fanaticism or hysterical devotion, but who loves all men persistently, intelligently, and optimistically, who sees divinity in them. All and who comprehends the techniques of the evolutionary development of the human consciousness. These ideas the intelligent public can and will accept. That, according to 
the demon who spoke through Alice Bailey and uh, channeled to her most of what we see in our uh, global uh, movement for peace today and oneness. Well, clearly, other religions are not pathways to God. To claim that they are is accusing Jesus of being a liar. If all religions were inspired by God, everyone's eternity in heaven would have been secure apart from Christ. One could gain entrance into heaven by embracing Hinduism, Buddhism, or any other religion. If this is true, there would have been no need for Jesus to come and pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus' work on the cross was unnecessary in that, in that case. God would have sent His Son and condemned Him to death for nothing if their worldview is true. But that is not the case. God sent His Son to intervene on our behalf because He loved us and our sin had to be dealt with. He made a way where there wasn't one. No other religious figure was able to take away our sins. No other religious figure is a savior. None can change your heart. Not Buddha, not Zoroaster, not Confucius, not your ascended master or your higher self or your quote-unquote holy guardian angel. None of them can regenerate your heart. Only Jesus Christ could do so because only He, as God's Son, was perfect. God's justice required a perfect sacrifice to blot out man's sin. John the Baptist accurately said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that is our Savior. Let us not reject so great a salvation as the one that has been promised to those who belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, my friends, let's uh, let me remind you once again before we get out of here. How about this? This was one of those old, one of those old shows from the the BFC days, the old long marathon shows, three and a half hours. Wow, that's that's too long. But anyway, you got you got plenty today. That's for sure. Let me remind you, folks, of this Friday. Friday, April 15th, this Friday at 6 p.m. We'll be live with Days of Noah and um, at, uh, at armoroftruth.net. And I'll show you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about here. If I can, goodness, if I can find it again. We're going to be talking about blood. The blood on the left is from someone who has not received a jab. The blood on the right is from someone who has received a jab. What's the difference? Why is there a difference? Uh, Dr. Peggy Minard, we're going to... Uh, she has been kind enough. Uh, Summer was able to communicate with her and get some information and some pictures, some photos of her work. She does dark field analysis, uh, live blood analysis. We're going to talk about that with Days of Noah on Friday at 6 p.m. at armoroftruth.net. If you want to know how to get there, we'll put the link in the description here. But uh, just go to armoroftruth.net and uh, scroll down to that thumbnail of the show. Click on that, and then you'll be there. That's where the show will be. Sign up for the live chat. You can sign in to start chatting. The live chat will be running from now, right on through the show, and for a couple days after the show. So we ask you, please, come join us at 6 p.m. at armoroftruth.net. We don't want to see any more of Dwaj Cool there. but And please, if you would, subscribe to our backup channel, True Normal TV on YouTube. Who knows what will happen to this channel. We've had a good run here for a while, so let's let's just let's make sure we <laughs> subscribed over here to True Normal TV. That's where we'll be if anything happens here. Also, we'll be on our on our website 
uh, but but we have to until we have a strong enough following you know we need to build our following here on youtube unfortunately that's just the way it works today so please join us come to the website and uh, find us there we also have now a cash app option if you want to support us go to armoftruth.net click on donations there are plenty of ways there to support us uh, it should be easy enough whatever method you have available you can use it there to support us also if you want to use cash app you can do that as well it's dollar sign a o t m i n a o t men for the cash app well thank you my friends for joining us today what a marathon this is uh we won't be doing one of these again for a while because that was hard work <laughs> it was it took us uh this was uh I, I don't know this this is 60 hours of of work to put this one together you know you can ask summer she was <laughs> she's been she's been right there with me doing it the whole time it's this has been a a stretch so we hope this has been a blessing to you in some way that we can see you know we're trying to equip you to be able to to win the debate with your friends your colleagues your family members about what's really going on in the world today and, and what's behind it that the agenda 21 sustainable development is nothing more underneath it all than a satanic spiritual movement that's what it is that's what it is ultimately and that when we see christian leaders like billy graham bill bright and unfortunately just seeing there it surprised me to find alvin planting a you know supporting these movements being being willing to stand alongside wiccan priestesses in spiritual uh work it's surprising but we need to be able to call evil evil and good good we need to be able to call things by their proper name. So we hope that this has been useful for you in that. Please, folks, uh, join us Friday evening at 6 p.m., armoftruth.net. You'll get some promo, some more uh, reminders from us here on the YouTube channel before now. Go to armoftruth.net. Please, join us over there. God bless you, my friends. We'll see you again here next time. <laughs> The hammer comes down and beats you over the head for the rest of your life with a big national security stick. And so that people learn to duck their head and not speak up. Because, bad idea now. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. Citizens are advised to take the following steps. Find us, armoroftruth.net. Oh, that's a rather interesting position coming from a man on a crusade against the evils of technology. I'm not against technology, Doctor. I'm against the men who deify it at the expense of human truth. Armor of Truth. Live. In the age of technocracy, scientism, and pop atheism, faith is resistance. of course announced the death of God and called for the birth of the Ubermensch, the Superman who would take humanity to new heights and to create a new world order. Find us at the Armor of Truth YouTube channel. Armoroftruth.net. The hammer comes down and beats you over the head for the rest of your life with a big national security stick. And so that people learn to duck their head and not speak up. Because, bad idea now. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. Citizens are advised to take the following steps. Find us, armoroftruth.net. In the age of technocracy, scientism, and pop atheism,
Superman. <laughs>